Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today we will be talking about three grammar rules to follow when you start learning Spanish. The first one is that as you have already heard, Spanish verbs are always conjugated. That means that they have to match with the subject of the sentence. For example, there are different pronouns in Spanish. Yo, tú, él, ella, usted, otros, nosotras, vosotros, vosotras, and ellos, ellas, y usted. All these pronouns have their own conjugations, and it's very common for beginners to mix them up. So remember this. When you start to conjugate the verbs, they have to match. The second rule is very important as well. The Spanish nouns and adjectives has to be in the same level. Let me explain you this. If you have a noun that is feminine and plural, for example, las mujeres, the adjective that you have to use right after the noun has to be feminine and plural as well. For example, las mujeres españolas. It is the same with the articles las, female and plural. We use this article because, as I say, it's female and plural. The third rule I already mentioned before, and be careful, English speakers, because the adjectives in Spanish go after the noun, not before like in English. This is very common for uh, students that learn Spanish and already speak or know English. When I say it, las mujeres españolas, españolas is the adjective, and I put it after las mujeres. In English, it would be the Spanish woman, but not in Spanish. Okay, there are some occasions where the adjectives go before the nouns. That is true, but normally this use comes out at intermediate level or advanced level. So do not worry when you are a beginner. Thanks for watching this video. And don't forget to subscribe to the italki YouTube channel. Over here. Take a lesson with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hasta luego. Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today I will be talking about seven Spanish words that are similar to their English counterpart. These words are also known as cognates. What a cognate is? A cognate is a word that has the same linguistic derivation that another word and it looks similar and when you pronounce it, it sounds almost the same. And here I will give you seven cognates so you can use them in Spanish as well. The first one is alcohol in Spanish. Guess you know what it means because it sounds pretty similar than in English, doesn't it? Number two is conclusión. This one has a different pronunciation in Spanish, but you will understand definitely when you start learning Spanish. Number three, three, <laughs> hobby. This one is completely similar. We basically took this word from English. Number four, individual. Of course, it's the same word, just different pronunciation. The next one, number five, is piercing. Yes, we use this word with the same pronunciation and meaning. Next one, number six, is informal. I like to use this one in my lessons to explain ways to greet and say goodbye because it's similar in English and the students understand very quickly. And the last are some words related to sports. If you are learning Spanish and you like sports, you are lucky because most of the words are cognates like football, tennis, baseball, volleyball, hockey, water polo, golf, surf, and so on. As you can see, almost all sports are cognates. So, talking about your hobbies should not be difficult. As you can see, there are many, and I would like to remember you that there are hundreds of cognates, and if you check them, you can be ready to your first Spanish lesson. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the italki YouTube channel 
for more tips on learning Spanish. Take a lesson with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher link in the description. Hasta luego. Hi everyone, it's I am going to be talking about business idioms or idioms you might hear in your office or in your workplace. A student asked me a really good question the other day. He asked me whether because I'm an, a native English speaker, do I know every single idiom? And the answer is no. Idioms are phrases or expressions that come from a particular place or a particular age group. So idioms are different in the UK to idioms in the United States. I have chosen five business idioms to talk to you about today, and you may hear them in an office in the UK or in the States. So hopefully they will be super useful for you. Idiom number one is the big picture. Imagine you go into a meeting and your boss says to you, you've lost sight of the big picture. What does that mean? That means that you are thinking too much about the small details of the project. And you are so interested in those little details that you don't remember what it is you're trying to achieve. So always keep sight of the big picture. The second idiom is to go the extra mile. Now imagine you're in an interview and the interviewer says to you that they are looking for someone who always goes the extra mile. What does that mean? Does it mean they want you to run around the office every day? No, it means they want you to do more than just what is in the job description. They want you to go that little bit further and to take on extra responsibilities that is going the extra mile. The third idiom is win-win situation. A win-win situation means everybody gains something. A really good example of this is these videos that I'm making for italki. Italki gains some content for their website, some lessons for their learners, and I have a platform where they can see me and book lessons with me. It's a win-win. Italki wins? And Caroline wins. The fourth idiom is word of mouth. So an example of this is think about how you found out about italki. Did you find italki by searching on Google or did you find italki because one of your friends recommended it to you? Recommendations from friends are word of mouth. It can be positive or it can be negative. If your company gets bad word of mouth, it is going to be a very difficult time for your company because people really listen to the opinions of their friends. So make sure whatever you do, you have good word of mouth about it. The fifth and final business idiom is to touch base. My manager used to say this to me a lot. To touch base means to have a very quick and short meeting about a project or something that you are working on. It might only be five minutes of your time. In that time, you will check that your understanding of the project is the same as your manager's understanding of the project. So I have a challenge for you. In your next lesson, I want you to ask your teacher if you can touch base about what you have learned in your lessons so far. One of the different subjects that you have been studying, you're touching base about the things you have covered so far. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to italki by clicking somewhere. <laughs> and you can take a lesson with me by clicking on my teacher profile in the description box. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Welcome back to the Stop Being Boring When Speaking English video series. When speaking to native English,
it's useful to use a variety of to make your conversations sound more interesting and flow. Others with your speaking abilities. In this next video, we will take a look at some American and British. American. John Hancock. Mm -hmm. So that's a person. It's a name of a person, yes. And it's American slang. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these? Um, Hello, everybody. Konnichiwa, minna san. Welcome to iTalkie's uh, live classes uh, for, this is our last week, our, actually we're in our last week of live classes with iTalkie, so welcome aboard. Kyo wa nihongo no benkyou shimasu, nihongo no benkyou shimasu. So today we are studying Japanese, okay? Please feel free to write in the chat, uh, in the comments, why you want to study Japanese, okay? So tell me your name, uh, your country, and why you're studying Japanese, okay? Also, if you want to, uh, please tell me your level of Japanese because I know some people yesterday in Atsuko's class had a bit of Japanese. We weren't quite beginner, so please tell me your name and uh, your level and your country, okay? So, in the chat box, Okay, so please write your name, your, uh, your country, and your level in the chat box, okay? Nice to meet you, everybody. I am Yemi, okay? I'm Yemi, I am from Barbados originally. This is Barbados, but now I live in Japan, okay? I've been living here in Japan for about uh, 11 years. I teach English here. Uh, right now I teach in a high school, but I've taught everything from kindergarten right up to university. I've taught business classes uh, here in Japan. And of course, through being here in Japan, I've also learned Japanese, which is why I'm teaching Japanese today. Okay, so feel free to introduce yourself in the comments. Okay. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with you. And we are going to look at uh, some first, we'll start with a little introduction. Okay. So um, here is my introduction, basic introduction for Japanese. If you've done classes before, you would have seen this, okay, before. So first, just listen to my introduction, and then I will repeat, you can repeat. And if you want to, you can try writing an introduction in the comment box, okay? Hajimemashite, Yemi desu. Barbados kara kimashita. Ima Fukushima ni sundemasu. Okay, so the, the translation is in the brackets. Hajimemashite, nice to meet you. Yemi desu, this is the simplest way of saying your name. Uh, I am Yemi. Uh, Barbados kara kimashita, I am from Barbados. Uh, Barbados. And now I live in Fukushima. Kyoshi desu, so you may also be familiar with the word uh, sensei. Okay, instead of kyoshi for teacher. Sensei is a respectful term. Okay, uh, it's, it's like a rank. Uh, and in Japan, hierarchy is very important. So sensei is something you say to someone above you, not just teachers, uh, doctors, lawyers, politicians, you can all use sensei. Okay, use sensei for all of those. Uh, but for yourself, because it's a respectful term, you don't want to pay respect to yourself uh, it's uh, then rude, so you would use instructor, more uh, kyoshi, which is more like instructor. I'm an instructor. And yoroshiku onegaishimasu, which is uh, just please uh, do me this favor, okay? Do be favorable with me kind of thing. It doesn't have a direct translation for English or for Spanish uh, or for any other language <laughs> uh, that's not East Asian, I think. <laughs> okay. So please let me know. Hi, Paolo. Nice to see you. Uh, 
you've never studied Japanese. Okay. And just doing it out of curiosity. Okay. Okay. Yes. So yes. So Paulo says, yes, sensei. Yes. So when you talk to someone else, you would say sensei, but if you yourself are a teacher, you would say kyoshi. Okay. All right. Let's practice this conversation. So listen and repeat. Hajimemashite. Now you can swap this for your name. I'll say Yemi. Please swap your name. Yemi this. Okay. Try to swap for your country. Barbados uh, And where do you live now? Ima Fukushima ni sundeimasu. Kyoshi desu. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Okay, so let's try one more time. Mochido yatte mimashou. Hajimemashite. Yemi desu. Barbados kare kimashita. Ima Fukushima ni Sundemas Kyoshi desu. Yoroshiku onegaishimas. Okay, so since we've got some new students today, let's just go over, just fly back up through here and go over some of the jobs and countries so that you can say your own job and country. Okay, so of course, I live in Japan now. Japan is Nihon. Nihon. Nihon ni sundeimasu. Nihon. My country, original country, Barbados. Barbados. Okay. If you're from Spain, Spain, Spain. Okay. It's pretty much the same because the U here is very short. Spain. If you're from Argentina, Argentina. Azentin. Okay. If you're from Colombia, Colombia, Colombia. Okay. So please tell me if you're from somewhere else, I can tell you what it is. Okay. Please write in the chat. Where are you from? Venezuela. Venezuela. Is Venezuela? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Is Puerto Rico? I know we get a lot of Italian, so let me put Italy. Okay, Italia, Italia. Oops, <laughs> sorry, we don't want any kanji. And we don't usually write Italy with kanji anyhow. Okay, Italia. Okay, any other countries out there? Italia. Any other countries are in with us today? Italia. Italy. Oh, Hungary. Okay. Hungary. Um Hungary. So Hungary has a long um, when you see this dash, it means extend the, the sound. Oof. Extend the sound. <laughs> okay. So, Hungary. Okay, Hungary. Okay, and Spain and Germany. So, Germany actually is based on the German word, not the English word. So we don't use German, we use Deutsch. Deutsch is the word for Germany. Okay, Deutsch. And anybody else? Deutsch. Again, this uh, U sound is very short, so Deutsch. It's like it's almost not there. Okay. Oh, Norway, Norway, Moimasne, Norway, Karakimashita. Oh, so 
Yo Yoakimu says, uh, he, she, I'm not sure, they studied uh, uh, Japanese for two years, 10 years ago. So a little bit of Japanese skill. Uh, Iwalina wants to know about my keyboard that I have hiragana and katakana. So let me show you, I, I speak a lot of languages. So I've installed, they're just the regular Microsoft keyboards. So I don't know if you can see it, ah, but I have English, um, Japanese, Korean, Russian, France, French, Chinese and Portuguese installed on my computer. I do not think you can see it, okay? Um, but yeah, my actually my computer comes with Japanese because I'm in Japan and I bought it with Japanese. The others I put, okay? So Japanese and English are already in my computer, Iwalina. But you can download if you have um, both iPad and, uh, not iPad, Mac and PC, you can download the keyboards that you want, okay? So you can you can change your language because um, I've downloaded lots of keyboards on both a Mac and a uh, PC, okay? Uh, let's see, we've got UK. So UK is Igirisu. Um, it's quite complicated with the difference between UK, UK and Oops. UK and England, but generally most Japanese speakers use igiris for both, I think. Okay, they're technically words that are not. <laughs> um, igirisu, igiris, UK. Okay, all right. Um, UK, Spain, Russia. Russia is Russia, Russia. Russia, okay, Russia, Russia, okay, uh, okay, <laughs> hi, Sylvia says, Sylvia des, Italia jin des, ima igiris ni sundeimas. Ah, okay, so Sylvia says she is from Italy and she lives in the UK now. And she has N5 Japanese. So the Japanese, uh, main Japanese test, uh, it goes from five to one. Everything in Japan, for some reason, the lowest is uh, a higher number. So one is the best for all the tests, okay? Uh, Barry says, Hajimemashite, Barry to moshimasu. Ah, okay. So Barry, it should be um, not to omoshimas, uh, to moshimas, okay? To moshimas, just so you know, okay? Like this, to moshimas, okay? Barry to moshimas. Eh, Nihongo benkyo no ah, Nihongo no benkyo ga shumi desu. Okay, his hobby, Barry's hobby, is to study Japanese. And watashi wa Nihongo ga. Mama desu. Mm, taishoku shimashita. Mm, okay, so you, you're retired, Barry. Uh, igiris jin de. Uh, igiris jin desu. Yoroshiku onegai shimasu. So Barry's from England. Okay, so let's run through our countries again. Okay. Let's run through our countries again. Hi, Daniel from Colombia. And never been in a Japanese class. Okay, so we'll do the, the basics. Okay. Um, just repeat the countries. Nihon. Nihon. Barbados. Barbados. Spain. Spain. Argentine. Argentine. Colombia. Colombia. Venezuela, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, Italia, Italia, Hungary, Hungary, Deutsch, Deutsch, Igiris, Igiris, Russia, 
Russia. Okay, so uh, let me put the oops, the phrase that you use to say where you came from. You can say, oops, you can say. Country name, kara kimashita, okay? Remember that in Japanese, the verb comes at the end. So this is really country from come, came, okay? So you can just put your country's name in there, Barbados kara kimashita, okay? Try saying that for practice knowing. Now, Deutsch kara kimashita, Igiris kara kimashita, Spain kara kimashita, Colombia kara kimashita, uh, where else? Hungary, karakimashita. Italia, karakimashita. Okay. All right. So now let's try our jobs. Okay. Because we also need our job for the introduction. Okay. So first job, kaishain. Kaishain. Okay. Uh, kaishain is a little difficult because um, the concept is different. We don't have this concept in English so much or in Spanish, Italian. I don't know Hungarian, so I can't say. Um, but it's a company worker. Kaisha is company. And this in just means member. Okay, so you'll see this in if you study. Uh, you'll see it tagged on to other uh, nouns meaning a member of something, okay? Kaishain is a member of a company, okay? So whereas in English or French or Spanish, we talk more about our role, we would say, I am in sales, I am in marketing. In Japanese, we would say, I am a member of a company, okay? I work for a company, kaishain. Okay, so if you're an office worker, if you do an office job, you would more than likely say, kaishain this, kaishain. Teacher, kyoshi, kyoshi, kyoshi desu, kyoshi. Doctor, isha, isha. Police, keisatsu, keisatsu. Okay, might also hear keisatsukan, keisatsukan desu. Singer, kashu. Kashu. Engineer. 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 Okay, so this one obviously comes from English. Okay. Uh, lawyer. Bengoshi. Bengoshi. And uh, this one is company president, uh, which is, I think, a little weird for English, but if you run your own, own company, you might say Shacho. Okay. Uh, something, some kind of company, no shacho this, okay? And you also use this term when you address your company president, uh, you say shacho san, okay? So tell me uh, if you have a different job and I will tell you what it is. So let's just go over these jobs one more time and then we will try to introduce ourselves. Kaishain. Kaishain this. I am a company worker. Kyoshi. Kyoshi desu. I am a teacher. Isha. Isha desu. I am a doctor. Keisatsu. Keisatsu desu. I am a police officer. Kashu. Kashi desu. I'm a singer. Engineer. Engineer desu. I'm an engineer. Bengoshi. Bengoshi desu. I am a lawyer. Shacho. Shacho desu. I am a company president. Okay, any more jobs? Marketing specialist. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so like I said, we don't do so much uh, with the roles. Um, uh, Evelina, we don't do so much of, with the roles, uh, but you could say, 
uh, marketing is marketing. So it's just like uh, uh, katakana marketing. Boot. So this is in the marketing department, marketing boot. Uh, I suppose the easiest thing to say would be ni imas or ni hataraitemas. Marketing boot ni hataraitemas. Okay, so there wouldn't be a term so much that we would use for marketing specialist. Okay, because this would all fall under marketing boot ni hataraitemas. This would all fall under kaishain, generally, okay? Uh, Joachimu says programmer. Okay, that one is also from English. A lot of computer terms or recent jobs, recent type jobs, they just come straight over from English. So just pro programma, okay? Programma. So same basically same with a long a ah on the end pro puro guram ma okay uh japanese we can't have two consonants come together there's only one final consonant which is n n so when you see two consonants in english they're often separated by a u sound because that sound almost disappears puro gurama Okay, programa. Okay, so now we know our jobs and our countries. Can you write your introduction? Hajime maste. Do 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 des. Do 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 karakimashita. Ima do 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 ni sundeimas. This one, if you live in the same place, uh, for example, Spain karakimashita. Ima Spain ni sundeimas. You don't have to say it. Okay, or you could say your city, Spain, Karakimashita, Ima, Barcelona, ni Sundemas. Okay, job, Kyoshi des, uh, Ingenia des, Bengoshi des, Programma des, uh, Marketing Buni, Hataraite mas. Okay, uh, Yoroshiku, Negaishimas. Okay, mm, Yoakimus says, Programma des. Uh, Sylvia says, Patissier. Oh, patissier. So patissier is straight from French, patissier, uh, patissier, okay, uh, who uh, makes cakes and desserts. Very popular job. Um, actually, I think it's the most popular job for elementary school girls all want to become patissiers. It's so popular here, okay? Okay, so how is it going? Hajime mashite. Name this country, Karakimashita. Ima city, ni sundeimas. Job, this, yoroshiku onegai shimas. Okay, are you able to? Let's go down back to our original lesson. Okay. All right, so I hope that you were able to. Introduce yourself now, okay? Oof, so many lessons. <laughs> All right, here we are. Okay, hajime maste, do 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 des, do 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 karakimashita. Ima, do 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 ni sunde imas. Kyoshi des, yoroshiku onegai shimas. Okay, so next, today we're going to learn some places, okay? So, first, this first place here is in. A police box, okay? And it's called Koban. Koban. It's a long O, so let me put that in there so it doesn't. The long O is usually represented by O U. Koban. Okay, let's try pronouncing. Koban. Koban. Okay, so the police box um, is just usually in the middle of the city, near a train station, near major intersections, okay? This is where you would usually go if you have a problem. Uh, your bicycle disappeared, someone took your bicycle, or uh, you forgot your wallet somewhere or something. This is where you go to report that sort of thing, okay? A keisatsu. Keisatsu, okay, show, which is a big, like, regional police station, you would go for more formal procedures. 
uh, like you need to change your name on your driver's license or something. But the coal ban is where you would go to report uh, most minor issues, coal ban. Okay, this is a department store and the Japanese is taken from English, depato. Depato, okay? So it's just from department, depato. Okay. This is a bookstore and uh, it would be written as, sorry, I have to find this sign, <laughs> Honya-san, okay? Honya-san. So the reason for the little dash is because uh, there are two types of N in Japanese. There's the final N and there's also an N that come at the beginning. So, so that you don't confuse them, if you write it in English, you need the dash to show that it's the final N, okay? Honya-san. And uh, this one over here is the bank. Let's go over a little bit. Okay, this is Ginko. Ginko. Okay, so let's just review those four. Koban. Koban. Depato. Depato. Honyasan. Honyasan. Ginko. Ginko, okay? So, uh, like I said, this one is uh, different. So, actually, for example, uh, let me give you an example where there are two different words that use uh, the same N. They look the same in English, but uh, they are different in Japanese. The pronunciation is different, okay? Uh, where are we? Okay. So these are pronounced differently in Japanese. Okay. So it's actually important not to join the N if it's a final N. Uh, this one, the N is a beginning N. Okay. This N is a beginning N. So it's attached to the syllable. Ge. So it's ge and then nin. Genin. Genin. And this one, the N is a final N, okay? So it's attached to the first syllable. Gen in, gen in, genin, genin. It sounds almost the same. <laughs> and at first you're like, what, which one? But <laughs> it's different, okay? They, they have different meanings. Genin is uh, the person that's lowly ranked and gen in is the, the cause of something, okay? So be careful not to join the N uh, if it's a final N, okay? All right, uh, then we have some more words, some more places. Let's try these places, okay? Well, we have a post office, you bin kyoku, okay? So let's try that. You bin kyoku, you bin kyoku, okay? You bin kyoku. We have a train station. Train station is a nice, easy word, eki. Eki. Okay. And this one is also taken from English. So it is restaurant. Restaurant. Okay. And we have a school. The school is gakko, gakko. Okay, when you have a double consonant, uh, it's like you pause right before the sound, so before the K sound, and then uh, you make that sound, so you pause first, gakko, gakko. Okay, so there's a little like click almost in there, um, as opposed to gakko, okay? Gakko. Uh, okay, so let's try uh, pronouncing all of them one more time. Koban. Koban. Depato. Depato. Honya-san. Honya-san. 
銀行。銀行。郵便局。郵便局。駅。駅。駅レストラン。レストラン。Okay, so now we're going to try asking about things in the neighborhood. Okay, Kono hen. Okay, in this area. Kono hen ni? In this area. Ka arimasu ka? Is there? Are there? Ka arimasu ka? Okay. So let's try this conversation, putting different words in this. Okay. Kono hen ni? Yubin kyoku ga arimasu ka? Kono hen ni yubin kyoku ga arimasu ka? So this is, is there a post office in this area? Okay, let's make it so we can see A and B. Hai, arimasu. Hai, arimasu. So yes, yes, there is, okay? Uh, one of the easy things about Japanese is you don't need a subject.、Um, it can get confusing sometimes because people drop the subjects, okay? So this is just is, exists, okay? But it means it's actually really easy to make sentences at the beginning, okay? Where are you going? All right. Okay. Hi, Arimas. Dududu no tonari ni arimasu. Dududu no tonari ni arimasu. So tonari is next to, okay? So if we look at these pictures, Kono hen ni yubin kyoku ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. What is it next to? Eki no tonari ni arimasu. Eki no tonari ni arimasu. Okay? All right, let's try with the. Department store. Okay, so the department store is next to the bookstore. Yes? All right. Kono hen ni departo ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. Honya san no tonari ni arimasu. Okay, let's try with、uh, the bank. Oh, the bank is also next to the bookstore. Let's try the, the school, make it a little interesting. Okay, so the school is next to the restaurant. Okay. Kono hen ni gakkou ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. レストランの隣にあります。ですエウェリーナポーランドから来ました。ポーランド。ポーランドから来ました。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。ポーランド。All right, so this time I'm going to be A. I will read the A lines, okay?、Uh, and you just read the B. Hi, Arimas, okay? And then we will switch, okay? So let's try, let's try the Eki, okay? All right, so all you have to say right now is Hi, Arimas, okay? Koro hen ni. 駅がありますかレストランの隣です。あ、ah,、sorry。This is actually a little strange. This should also be B. So let's put this up here. Okay, let's try that again. This time you have to say it's next to the restaurant. Okay? It's next to the restaurant. レストランの隣にあります。この辺に駅がありますかオッケ
So let's try mm, the Coban. I'll say Coban. And you would say it's next to the department store. Depato. Depato. Okay. Koro hen ni Koban ga arimasu ka? Okay, so let's switch. This time you try asking the question. Kono hen ni du 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 ga arimasu ka? Okay, let's see. Where should we go? Try with gakko. Okay, try to get that pause pronunciation. Gakko. Okay, you say a little bit of the letter gakko. It stops. Okay, <laughs> gak, like halfway through. Gakko. Okay. So, kono hen ni gakko ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. Restaurant no tonari ni arimasu. Okay. Okay, so now tell me what's in your neighborhood. Okay, what is in your neighborhood? So, watashi is I or me. Okay, and no is like the apostrophe. So this watashi no together is my. Okay, watashi no kinjo ni wa in my neighborhood. Watashi no kinjo ni wa nani nani ga arimasu. Nani nani ga arimasu. Oh, my typing is bad today. <laughs> Watashi no kinjo ni wa nani nani ga arimasu. Okay. Or uh, if you want to say more than one thing, we could also say watashi no kinjo wa nani nani to. Okay. To is and for adding together nouns. Okay. And you can use it as many times as you need. Watashi no kinjo ni wa mm, depato to. Honya-san to ginko ga arimasu. Okay, like this. So what is in your neighborhood? Please try writing what is in your neighborhood. Watashi no kinjo ni wa kouban ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa depato ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa honya-san ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa Ginko ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa yubin kyoku ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa eki ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa restaurant ga arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa gakko ga arimasu. Mm, so let's see. Really, in my neighborhood, there is uh, there's no police box, I think. <laughs> Uh, oh, but we do have a big police station, but you don't know that word, so we won't go there. <laughs> there's no department store. I don't think there's a bookstore. There's a bank. There's a post office. There's so many post offices in, in Japan. Um, there is a train station. There is a restaurant. And there is a school, okay, for my neighborhood. So, watashi no kinjo ni wa... 銀行と郵便局と駅とレストランと学校があります。Okay,私の近所には銀行と郵便局と駅とレストランと学校があります。What okay, about you? Okay, あなたはどうですか? あなたの近所にはどうですか? Nani ga arimasu ka? What's in your neighborhood? Nani ga arimasu ka? What is there? Nani ga arimasu ka? Please write if you can. Okay? Watashi no kinjo ni wa tududu ka arimasu. Watashi no kinjo ni wa tududu ka arimasu. Sorry. Throat is a little dry. Noro ga kawaiteru. So in English, when we say my throat is dry, uh, we usually just mean uh, I feel a little dry hair. In Japanese, 
Nodo ga kawai teru, which means my throat is dry, actually means I'm thirsty. Okay? Uh, so there is no separation between dry throat and thirsty. My throat is dry means I am thirsty. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Sylvia says, Watashi no kinjo ni wa gakkou ga arimasu. Gakkou ga arimasu. Wow. Sylvia, good job with your uh, hiragana and kanji. Okay. Mm. Uh, kinjo is the short O. So it's not OU. Uh, it's the short O, kinjo. Okay, so no u, just kinjo. Oops. If you want to write it in Japanese, it is just kinjo. Okay, just that. Watashi no kinjo ni wa, mm, nani ga arimasu ka minna? Nani ga arimasu ka? Sylvia says uh, she has a school. Sylvia no kinjo ni wa, gakkou ga arimasu. Gakko ga arimasu ne. Okay. Okay, let's move on. All right, so let's look at some fruits and vegetables. Completely different topic. And then we're going to try buying fruits and vegetables. Okay. So first, uh, we have ninjin. Ninjin. Okay, let me try and put some words here for you. Ninjin. Okay. That is a carrot, obviously. Hamanegi. Hamanegi is an onion, obviously. This one, as you can see, <laughs> taken from English, tomato. Tomato. Well, taken from English or Spanish or uh, somewhere. Okay, taken from a foreign country. Habocha. Habocha. Okay. Bingo. Bingo. Orange. Orange. Nashi. Nashi. So there's a Western pair and there's also a Japanese pair. They're both called nashi. Uh, you might differentiate with uh, this one you might call yonashi, Western pair. Okay. Kyabetsu. Kyabetsu. Okay. Kyuri. Kyuri. And how to do this? And last one, jagaimo, jagaimo. So imo just means potato, and so there are various types of potato. You just switch the beginning, okay? So satsumaimo is a sweet potato, and nagaimo is a yam. Jagaimo is the potato, okay? All right, so let's practice those again. We have ninjin, ninjin. Tamanegi, tamanegi, tomato, tomato, kabocha, kabocha, dingo, dingo, orange, orange, nashi, nashi, kiabets. Cabbage, kiuri, kiuri, jagaimo, jagaimo. Okay, so let's just talk about, first let's just talk about which one you like. Okay, so like in Japanese, we say something ga suki desu, okay? Something gaskides. Which of these fruits or vegetables do you like? Okay, ninjin gaski desu ka? Tamanegi gaski desu ka? Tomato gaski desu ka? Kabocha gaski desu ka? Lingo gaski desu ka? Orange gaski desu ka? Nashi gaski desu ka? Kiabetsu gaski desu ka? Kiuri gaski desu ka? 
じゃがいもが好きですか Which one do you like? Please try writing, okay? Something ga skides. Let me make these a little smaller so you can see everything at the same time. Okay, see the words and everything at the same time. I don't know what's going on with the potato. The potato is too big. Okay, let's try making the potato smaller. Okay, so let's see. Which one do you like? Which one do you like? Okay, something ga ski des. Is that it? Yes. Oops. Something ga ski des. So we can see all of the words now. Which one do you like? Ninjin. Watashi wa, mmm, nashi? Nashi ga suki desu. Mmm, nashi kana? What about you? What do you like? Which of these fruits or vegetables? Kuramono to yasai no naka de, dochi ga suki desu ka? Dochi ga suki desu ka? Okay, so ga suki desu is like, usually to make a question, all we have to do is add a question particle. Ka. Okay. So, nashi ga suki desu. I like pears. Nashi ga suki desu ka? Do you like pears? Okay. Uh, because we've skipped the subject, we don't have to change anything for the difference between I and you. Okay. Ah, Sylvia too. Sylvia likes、uh, pears. Nashi to ringo ga suki desu. Nashi to ringo ga suki desu. Sylvia says she likes apples and pears. Nashi to ringo ga suki desu. Ah, and Barry says, orange. Orange ga suki desu. Orange ga suki desu. So Barry likes oranges. Barry likes oranges. Grazia says, kabocha ga suki desu. Oh, that's a rare choice. <laughs> kabocha ga suki desu. She likes pumpkins, Grazia.、Mm. Okay.、Mm. Watashi wa nashi ka na. Nashi ga suki desu. Okay. Let's try buying these fruits. In a small store. So you have to ask the person for the fruits. Okay, so I'm going to write a little conversation. Do you remember how to say, is there? We did it with the buildings. Is there? Is there? Think about it. I'm going to write,、mm, is there? Okay, I'm going to keep writing and you can think about how do we say, is there? So we had, eki ga. Mm hmm. What was it? Okay.、Um, is there any something? Hi. And of course, the word for there. <laughs> so we will come back to that while you think. Keep thinking. Okay. Oops. Ram. Okay, so do you remember what was the word for is there? Anybody remember? What was the word for is there? Any ideas? Ah,、oh, Paolo. Good job, Paolo. Yoku yatta ne. Gambatta ne, Paolo. Yes, arimas. Okay, and we add the question particle. The question particle, ka. Okay, so is there this fruit? Or this vegetable, do do do, ka, arimas ka, kyabets ka, arimas ka, hmm, hi, arimas, yes, there is cabbage, or、uh, more naturally in English, yes, we have cabbage, yes, we have cabbage, okay,、uh, and then we're going to、uh, put a number here to say how many hyaku is hundreds. Of grams, we would like. Okay, so let's go over our numbers quickly so you can remember them. Okay, the first one is ichi, ni, san, shi. I'll come back to shi because there's a weird thing that happens here.、Uh, go. Roku, 
Chichi. Also come back to that. And uh, where are we? Hachi. Q. Two. Okay. So these are the numbers. When we count, this is the way we count. Ichi, ni, san, shi, go, roku, shichi, hachi, kyu, ju. Okay. But uh, something happens with a couple of the numbers. Okay. She happens to be the Japanese, also the same pronunciation for death. So we avoid saying she. Uh, sometimes we avoid the number four completely, but sometimes we just avoid saying she. Okay. So these are actually, these numbers here are Chinese numbers, uh, both Korean and Japanese inherited Chinese numbers, but also have their own numbers. So it gets a little uh, interesting with what to use when kind of thing, what kind of thing do you say, in which situation, okay? So because she means death, we switch uh, quite often for the number four and use the Japanese number, yon, okay? Or yo, sometimes shortened to yo, okay? Uh, for shichi also, we switch and use the Japanese number, which is nana, okay? Instead of shichi, okay? All right, so let's practice these numbers uh, and then we will try this conversation, okay? So listen and repeat. Ichi. Ichi. Ni. Ni. San. San. Shi. Shi. And still four. Yon. Yon. Roku. Roku. Shichi. Shichi. Nana. Nana. Hachi. Hachi. Kyu. Kyu. Ju. Ju. Okay, so these are the numbers that we're going to need. Uh, well, not Ju, because we wouldn't say 10 hundred. We won't say, we won't use Ju. Okay, uh, and we just have to put the numbers in the space before 100. Just one more thing, <laughs> one more little complicated thing. Uh, sometimes in Japanese, when two words join together, they don't just join, they, they, they merge, okay? So think of it like, um, normally, if a word joins, we think of it like oil and water. The oil is here, the water is here. But uh, in Japanese, sometimes words mix like paint. So you put red and you put blue and then they mix together and it's completely different, okay? So for ichi, um, oh, well, ichi we don't need because we just say hyaku if it's ichi. Um, ni hyaku, that's okay. After the N, san hyaku is difficult to say, so it becomes san byaku. Okay. Yon, uh, yon, byaku, yon, hyaku, yon hyaku is okay. Yon hyaku. Uh, go hyaku, rok, rok. <laughs> This is different. So for 600, rope byaku. Rop byaku. Okay. Nana hyaku, hap byaku. Uh, for 800, hapyaku. Okay, so these words, um, and these words are, they tend to merge with other things quite often. San and roku and hachi, okay. Kyu, hyaku, okay. 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 So uh, let's try this conversation, okay? So this is just, do you have something? Yes, we have it. Well, I would like some hundred grams, okay? Uh, what should we say? Let's say yokai. <laughs> uh, I understand. <laughs> yokai. <laughs> okay. So this is like a little country shop, okay? It's not the politest. It's just regular talking, okay? Uh, when you go to the country, it's not very... Uh, polite level of usual Japan, 
but we will we will use this level because uh, usually these shops are in the country. And usually, if you want to buy uh, fruits, you just buy them in the supermarket. You don't have to ask anybody. But in the country, we will practice in the country so that we can say the conversation. Okay, so let's start with pumpkin. Do you have pumpkins? Okay, so listen and repeat. Do you have pumpkins? Kabocha ga arimasu ka? Kabocha ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. Hai, arimasu. 500g ga hoshii desu. 500g ga hoshii desu. Ryokai. Ryokai. Okay, so this one is just, uh, do you have pumpkins? Do you have pumpkins? Uh, yes, I have pumpkins. Uh, uh, so I would like 500 grams then. Give me 500 grams of pumpkins. Okay, I understand. Ryokai is I understand. Okay, uh, be careful with the R Y O. Um, these sounds with one consonant and either Y A Y O or Y U. They are one sound, which is very difficult for foreign people to say. Often it's not Rio, it's Yo Yo. Okay, so it's not Rio Yo. It's one sound. Okay, uh, let's try with something else. Let's try uh, this time with, let's buy some onions this time, okay? And we will ask for 300. Remember, 300 changes, okay? It's not hyaku for 300, it's byaku, okay? So remember, we'll change that. Okay, let's try buying some onions. Tamanegi, okay? Tamanegi ga arimasu ka? Hai, arimasu. 300g ga hoshii desu. Yokai. Okay, I want 300 grams. I want 300 grams. Okay, so this time I will be A. Okay, please be B. Be the shopkeeper. Hai, arimasu. Yokai. Okay, that's all you have to say. Hi, Arimas and Yokai. I am going to get 200 grams of 200 grams of what? Cabbage. Okay, let me get 200 grams of cabbage. So I'm A. Please read B. Cabbage ga arimasu ka? gram ga hoshii desu. Okay, good job, good job. Hi, Vietzania, how are you? <laughs> okay, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. We're almost done for today. Have any questions, leave them in the comments, okay? Um, I'll try one more. This time, let's see. So this time you will be A, and let's get you to ask me about cucumbers i love cucumbers so let's get some cucumbers okay so cucumbers do we have cucumbers and ask me for 800 grams of cucumbers remember 800 changes so it's not just hachi it changes to hapyaku okay and of course we have the double p so we have to stop hapyaku okay like halfway through the p hap and you don't push it out, stop, hap, piyaku, hap, piyaku, hap, piyaku. Okay, so there's a small stop in this word, hap, piyaku. Okay, so please ask me for cucumbers. Go ahead. Hi, arimasu. Yokai. Okay, so I think we can wrap up here for today. Uh, yes, Vietzania, we are doing <laughs> Japanese today, Vietzania. Yes, so tomorrow I'll be back with English. Tomorrow I'm on at uh, what time? Maybe nine o'clock. 
uh, sorry, nine o'clock Japanese time, two o'clock, two o'clock in Spain. Yes, so I'm on uh, at two o'clock in Spain with English tomorrow. <laughs> okay, Vietnamese, I'll see you in English tomorrow. Uh, so we're just about done. Any questions? Any questions for me for today? Okay, we learned about places. We learned Koban, Depato, Honyasan, Ginko, Yubin Kyoku, Eki, Restaurant, Gakko. Okay, the places we learned. Uh, and we learned our fruits and vegetables, ninjin, tamanegi, tomato, kabocha, ringo, orange, nashi, kyabetsu, kiuri, jagaimo. Okay, and we learn how to say we like them. We learn how to ask if something is there. Okay, any problems, any questions? Is it okay? Uh, Sylvia says, Yemi sensei, arigato gozaimasu. Hai. <laughs> arigato gozaimasu. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. So, last, let me tell you one word. We use this to say goodbye when we want to say, I appreciate your hard work. Okay, so you guys worked really hard today. So, I will tell you, Otsukare sama desu. Otsukare sama desu. Okay, this is what we use when we work really hard. Uh, we can say to people, Otsukare sama desu. So, very good job today. Otsukare sama desu. See you next time. Mata ne. Give me an example. Okay. So, can I please have your John Hancock at the bottom of this paper? Come on, you gotta get it now. Is it your signature? Yes, you got it. That was easy. Okay. Awesome. Number one, British peak. What does peak mean? Like uh, taking a peak. No, that's, that's Sorry, that's not taking a peak. That, that's not smack. This is taking. But that's just like taking a peak, that's not a slang. Oh. Like in a slang of peak. Like the peak of a mountain? That's not slang. That's actually yeah, like that is the peak of a mountain. I don't know. Tell me. Okay, let me give you an example. So say you go out, you go out one night and you lose your purse, your keys. Is it like phone. the most horrible situation you can be in? Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, that's so peak. You'd be like, oh so, yeah. How was your night? It was so peak. I just got fired. So peak. Exactly. So it's like the peak of badness, I guess. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. so the peak. Two, American. Jacked. Jacked. Does, Jacked. That, does that mean like hench? What does hench mean? Like say you go to the gym. Don't answer back with a slang word. <laughs> <laughs> so the British equivalent of jacked would be hench, I think. Okay. So if someone's like really ripped. Yes, exactly. Okay. Go to the gym, work out a lot. Like, Whoa, look at them, they're so jacked. We would say hench. Number two, British. Peng. 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 P E N G. Peng. Like someone being hanged on the head or some word. <laughs> just thinking of peng. It's similar, I don't know. I guess it's a little similar. Um, no. Give me an example. Um, okay, so for example, say you're eating a cake, it's delicious, you can say, oh, this is peng. Does it just mean delicious? Mm, you could use it in other contexts. I mean, well. like, you can spa, you know? Yeah, but I could also say that your eyes are peng. Oh. Or a person is peng. Just to mean, like, extraordinarily awesome? Basically. Oh, if, you, yeah. if you're talking about a person, you might even say peng ting. Peng ting. Like, he's a peng ting. Okay. This is mostly like he's like a ten. Yeah, exactly. So like the like the top of the top. Yeah, basically. Number three, American. I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. What a nightmare. I blew it. Yeah. So that means that you've completely ruined the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Say so like I didn't make it into didn't make it into school. So my parents will not be proud of me. I blew it. Yeah, when you locked up late to work, don't really ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never late. <laughs> Number three, British. Having a mare. 
having a bad having a bear, a nightmare, like horrible real nightmare in realistic in reality, basically. Very good. Okay. That's exactly that's a lot easier than what was Jim's venue? Having a man? You were having a man before? I was having a man. Yeah. Not understanding anything she was saying. Yeah, exactly. So there you have it. There's our British and American slang. Tell us what you thought of it. Did you understand it? And we'll see you next time. My name is Wong Win. Tenpola Wong Win. It's really amazing thing for me. From uh, from Ataki, I can meet people around the world, and they can give me more energy to live and more inspiration to live in the world also. Very magical, <laughs> yeah. When. Uh, when I can go on lesson and I feel that uh, I'm doing a very good job and then working at home with a very wonderful team. Uh, I think that I can do something and, uh, and I, I'm doing something here. I think that I can uh, say idea and talk with people. That is the first motivation for me to come here. The second thing that I can have some money for my life to make my life become better and uh, more comfortable. It's a very wonderful website of Adaki because Adaki is the connection between the every people in the world with each other. There are many purposes for us to learn a new language. Innovation is the most important. Not only study language, but also share an idea and culture and everything else in the life. And through the learning and, uh, and teaching, and uh, we can share more ideas and we can share our life better. You know, you know that because each person have a, their own experience and their own knowledge and their own way of living. And when we meet the new people and within that we are we are discovering a new universe or a new area or something like that. <laughs> so it's wonderful that we have this diversity and we should just learn from each other. But if you at least just learn a second language and expose yourself to a second culture, not only do you understand that culture better, but you understand your own culture better. And if most people just did that and were talking openly and honestly themselves and other people, I don't think there would be any diversity problems. Because we're all learning from each other. He is a very good student. He studied very well and he just learned for, you know, he just only studied for one month, but now he can speak very much Vietnamese. Later on, yeah, the student and the teacher can meet in uh, in a different country, and then uh, the relationship be become very good. We drink coffee together, and we uh, go uh, and I ride a motorbike, and I take them uh, along uh, somewhere beautiful together, and we uh, talk together, and then they come back to their country, and we become teacher and student again. We study again, <laughs> yeah. The number of refugees worldwide has reached historic levels as tens of millions of people seek asylum from conflicts in their home countries. Even for those able to reach countries willing to take them in, rebuilding their lives and careers in unfamiliar societies often proves challenging. For one group of refugees living in Istanbul, teaching online Arabic lessons to students across the world has offered a way to overcome these obstacles and establish new hope. As well as earning income, they have been able to share their experiences with people from different cultures and backgrounds, cultivating meaningful relationships with students. My name is Rahaf and I'm from Latakia, Syria. Previously, I had a normal but busy life. My name is Abdullah and I'm a Syrian guy from Homs, the capital of funny jokes. Hello, my, my name is Amr. Uh, I'm an Arabic teacher on Aitoki. Uh, I'm from Egypt. Hi, I'm Hussam. 
I'm from Syria, Al Haseka, and I'm a teacher on Italki you now. Three years ago, I came to Turkey to solve many challenges. Uh, came in one time. Leaving a country is not, or leaving your home. This is one. It's like fish out of the group. I mean, yeah, my, the challenge that my is almost dead. This is the only challenge now. Online teaching, yeah, it, it solves this problem, of course, because you can just be wherever and get online and start your class. What Italki offered me is like new students I have never met from another continent, way far from me. Once they want to like learn my language, I feel like this is like I feel sometimes emotional. Italki, Besser College, and a small project, Istanbul, are working together on this project. You know, it's important for people to kind of see um, and get to know someone who's experiencing a difficult time or who um, has had a, a difficult past and to um, just remember people are people are people. We need to remember that, um, you know, we're, we have a shared humanity and I think that gets lost a lot in the media or in the news. I'm teaching Arabic for first year students of Arabic in America. Uh, we both enjoy teaching and learning online. Uh, it's an amazing experience for me as a teacher. I find it so helpful for me, also for the students. Going into it, people might like, like have these assumptions that you're supposed to like learn something about refugees or like understand something new. But I think it's like most valuable to realize that like you're not really learning anything new, other than that like this is like. Just, just another person, just like you. My tutor, Mohammed, was like so nice and so willing to work with my level of speaking and comprehension. At the beginning, teaching online was a new experience for me, and it had a, a lot of challenges. But now I'm used to it, and honestly, I am enjoying teaching Arabic on iTalk. I care now. I care more. I care more about the language, I care more about my students. Teaching Arabic is something valuable for me. Maybe give me hope or I feel gain hope. I, it's reward for me. Hi, I'm a language learning app. Can we move on? This is a dog. I don't have a dog. Repeat after me. This person eats bread. I want to practice English for my job interview. Shh. Incorrect. You haven't reached this lesson yet. Now repeat after me. This person eats bread. Fine. This person eats bread. That's better. Moving on. ¿Cansado de aplicaciones de idiomas inflexibles? Usa italki para aprender como tú quieras aprender y estudiar cualquier idioma con nativos. Meet Peter. He is learning Chinese. He was studying on his own with textbooks, flashcards and apps, but is still having problems with... This is Maria. She loves learning English, but she doesn't have many opportunities to use it. With italki, Peter and Maria are able to get personal online lessons to help them become fluent in a foreign language. You can start learning a language on italki today. Just follow these three simple steps. 1. Select the language. English, Spanish, Chinese, French, Japanese. Italki has teachers for every language. 2. Select the teacher. With italki, you can choose from thousands of experienced teachers from all over the world. And three, schedule a lesson. Online language lessons are the next best thing to living in a foreign country. With italki, you'll have a personal language teacher and real conversations with native speakers. Every day, thousands of people are connecting to international teachers through italki. Find a teacher today and become fluent in a foreign language. Hello 
everybody. Hello, welcome to today's live stream class for English. My name is Sarah Rose and I'm an English teacher here on italki. And I hope we have some students from other classes. Please, um, if you have come to my classes before or if this is your first class, let me know in the comments. Today, we're going to talk about meetings in English. So this is a type of business English. Um, in my last class, we talked about small talk and how we make conversation with new people and how we are polite in English, how we show respect. <clears throat> and in some of my other classes, we have spoken a bit about job interviews and CVs and things like that. And I think this class brings those two topics together because we're going to be talking about what English we use when we are at a business meeting and when we are at work, really. So it's it's kind of an English at work class. Um, please say hello in the chat. I'm going to open my presentation if I can. And then I'm going to see who we have in class with us today. So let's do this. Share my screen with you. Here we have meetings in English. That should be on. Okay. Let's have a look who we have today. Okay. Ah, Mariano, it's your first class. Brilliant. You can comment on um, italki page or you can comment on YouTube. There are two pages and I am reading them both, I think. Let's check. Have I got, the, have I got them both up? Yes. Okay. So I have both of those open and we have a lot of comments, I think, on the italki page. Yeah. Mariano, welcome to your first class. Um, Richard, hello, nice to meet you. Hi, Bletsania in Paris. Okay, uh, hello, hello, Irina, Elena, brilliant. Hi, everybody. Hello from Ukraine, wonderful. Okay, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Um, if you can type in the comments box what your name is and where you are joining us from today, that would be great. So, when I say, where are you joining us from? I mean, where are you in the world? I am in Alicante in Spain, in the south of Spain, but I'm from England, but I live in Spain. And my other question is, what new English word have you learnt this week? I like to ask this question to my students because we always need to be learning new vocabulary. Um, and often our, my students learn lots of new words between classes. So have you learned a new word in class or outside of class? I am a native English speaker, but yesterday I learned a new word, the word interminable. I, I did know this word, but I never really 100% knew the meaning. So I looked it up. Interminable means it's another word for endless never ending. Um, you might know in English, we like synonyms. We have lots of words for the same, the same meaning. And this is one of them. Of course, if you speak Spanish or perhaps another Latin language, you will see terminar is in this word, interminable, terminar, which is similar to the English word terminate to end or the terminator. And we have in at the beginning. So we know it's a negative here to not terminate, endless, unending. Let's see, have we got anybody who's got new words that they've learned? Put them in the thing. Oh, somebody said, I learned homesickness as a new word. That's a really good word, homesickness. Does anybody at the moment feel homesick? Well, a lot of us are stuck at home. We can't leave home in Spain. Um, so many of us might feel the opposite of homesick. I don't know what that means. The opposite of homesick, perhaps we feel sick of being at home. Um, but because I am English, I, I feel homesick sometimes when I'm in Spain because I want to go home. That's what homesickness means. Um, oh, someone, Richard says, I learned the word to grapple with. Ah, oh, it's a wonderful word to grapple, which means to kind of, to 
to be able to do or to learn to do something or to try to do something. Somebody learnt, Mariano learnt droplet, a tiny drop of water or rain, perhaps a droplet. That's a very pretty word. I like that. Um, yeah, you're right. Fletzania says homesickness means that you miss your friends a lot. Good. New words for this week. Ah, oh, Irina has learnt many words. Excellent. Implicit learning. Wonderful. Implicit is a beautiful word. Awkwardness. Quitter. Really, really nice. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. If anybody else has learnt new words, please put them on. Any new English words? And let's see what we're going to learn today. So we're going to talk about meetings, business meetings. First, we're going to do a little bit of information about how we structure meetings and maybe look at some vocabulary related to meetings. And then we're going to talk about participating in meetings. Now, meetings are generally a conversation. And to participate in a conversation or in a meeting, we need to be able to express our opinions, maybe present our ideas. Sometimes we need to interrupt somebody or we need to change the subject. There's a lot of skills and English language that we use when we are in meetings. And I like to think about um, when we are learning English, think about what type of English do I need for this situation? What can I do in my native language that I can't do in English? And that's what I want to look at today to try and help you participate in meetings in, in a more comfortable way. Or if you don't have meetings, I think that this topic is also useful for any conversations that we have. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We have a couple more new vocabularies here. Wind down, I learned yesterday, says Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy says she learned to wind down. What does that mean? That means to relax after a long day. And how do you like to wind down, Nancy? Do you wind down by reading, by sleeping, by gardening, doing exercise? How do you wind down? It's a good word, a good phrasal verb there for us. Okay. What I want to know, first of all, meetings. Do you like meetings and do you often have them? So in your career, do you have a lot of meetings or do you not really have many meetings? I Now I am a teacher, but I used to work in an office. I used to work in an office. And I had so many meetings. I used to have meetings every day with different people. Um, and I think this uh, picture here is quite funny here. Uh, perhaps, do you agree with this, this cartoon? I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to tell me in the comments, do you like having meetings? Do you have a lot of them? Why, what's this cartoon mean? Okay. Are you lonely? don't like working on your own, hate making decisions, then call a meeting. You can see people, draw flow charts, feel important, impress your colleagues, all on company time. Meetings, the practical alternative to work. Okay, do you agree with this? Is our meetings just an alternative to work? Or are meetings actual work? Let's just check some vocabulary here on this cartoon. All on company time. What does that mean, on company time? You can see people feel important on company time. When we say company time, we mean that it's, it is the time or the hours that you are paid to work by the company. So the company is paying you to work from maybe nine till five. That means nine until five o'clock is company time. Usually on company time, we have to work because we are paid to work on company time. But this cartoon says maybe you don't have to work if you have a meeting. Have a look. Um, somebody says, hello, I have meetings every day and I hate most of them. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that we've started positive. Good. Yeah. Um, 
totally agree with the cartoon. Lucas says the cartoon is the truth, <laughs> is it? Okay, so we have some people who are not quite sure if they um are, if they like meetings. Marina says, does Marina, yes, do you mean yes? Marina, yes, you have meetings, or yes, you like meetings. What's the difference here? Well, sometimes we have meetings, but we don't like them. What else? Does anybody else agree with this cartoon that we have meetings? We don't do any works in meetings. It's an alternative. It's not actual work, like Luca says. Um, Mariano says, we lost a lot of time on meetings. Ah, good. OK, we're going to come back to that comment. Because we don't say we lo lose time in meetings, really. I think you mean we waste time. This is what we usually say. Marina agrees with the cartoon. Yes, you do. Okay. Luca, yeah. Often it's a, a total waste of time. <laughs> All right. So I have some quotes about meetings. I think I know which one you're going to say you agree with. But can you tell me which quote you most agree with? Which is your favourite quote? OK, I'll read them out so that you can um, tell me which one you like the most. A, we spend too long talking about work and not enough time doing work. OK, so often in a meeting we talk a lot. But do we do work in a meeting? B. I like meetings because they are a good time to collaborate. Collaborate is a nice formal word to mean to work together, to do teamwork, to work with other people. I like meetings because they are a good time to collaborate. C, most meetings are a waste of time. OK, so Luca and Mariano have already said this, <laughs> that they... Um, that they think is a waste of time or we, we waste time in meetings. D, I find meetings useful, especially when the chair is good. What is the chair of a meeting? A chair? Well, obviously, we know what a chair is. I'm in a chair now. I'm sitting in a chair. You probably are too. But when we talk about meetings, what is the chair of a meeting? What do they do? The chair is the person who manages or runs the meeting. They control the meeting. They have the agenda. They say who can speak um, and, and they manage it. If you have a good chair, they make sure everybody can speak, everybody participates, that everything is on time. We don't waste time. But a bad chair will let one person talk for a long time and then lose track of time and it's too late and we don't get to do everything on the agenda. So it's good to have a good chair. This is a person, the chair of the meeting. Let's have a look. OK, Luca likes C, very similar to what you already said, Luca. Uh, Gratia says A, A, OK, C, C and A. So we have a lot of people who do not like meetings or think they're that helpful. Manuela on um, YouTube says A as well. Hi, Manuela. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Ma, I hate meetings after lunch. You can feel sleepy. Ah, so maybe you are having lunch now. It's lunchtime in Spain now. Are you doing the cla this class after lunch? Do you feel sleepy after lunch? Um, definitely. Uh, what are the, why do people not? So why, why do you think they are a waste of time? And why do you think, um, why do you like quote A? Serhi, because we don't want to do the work, le, the, sorry, because we don't want to do the work. We spend too long talking about the work. OK, so what do we call that when instead of doing something, we just talk about it or we do something else? The word for that in English is to procrastinate, procrastinate. So do you think meetings are just an opportunity to procrastinate, perhaps? Um, <laughs> procrastinate. Thank you, Elena. Excellent. OK, wonderful. All right. You can feel. OK, so I think we've got a few people in the room who don't or in the class today who don't like meetings. I. I'm definitely 
the odd one out then because I used to like meetings. Maybe it's because I like talking. <laughs> if I, and if you like talking, a meeting is a great opportunity um, to talk. I like talking so much that now I'm a teacher because when you are a teacher, you talk a lot. And when you are a teacher on italki, basically every class is a bit like a meeting because you just meet with other people. So I do like meetings, but sometimes they can be very, uh, they can be a waste of time. Um, okay. So thank you for sharing your opinions. Although some of us don't like meetings, I think we know that we do have to have them. So what type of meetings do you have out in your life? Somebody said, I think it was, who was it? Was it Haley? I'm sorry, I've forgotten now. There's so many names coming up. Um, somebody said that they have meetings every day um, at work and they don't like them. But we don't just have meetings at work, do we? We can use the word meeting even when it's not at the workplace. So we have business meetings at work. Usually when I think meeting, I think between um, between colleagues. Yeah, you meet with your team or you meet with your manager and you have a meeting. Um, and remember, we say have a meeting, not make a meeting or do a meeting. We have a meeting. But outside of work or maybe with your business, but not necessarily, we also have meetings with lawyers, accountants, landlords. That's the person if you rent your house or your apartment, maybe you have to meet with the landlord, the person who owns your flat or with the estate agent. Maybe if you are a parent, you meet with your teachers of your children. So if you go into school and you meet the teachers and you talk about your child's progress, this is something that I know many people who live in the UK who do not have English as their native language, who speak English as a second language, like all of the class today, um, that can be quite a nerve-wracking or scary thing to go to school because you really want to know how your child is doing. You want to find out about your child, but if you're English, if you aren't confident in English, it can be scary. Some people have family meetings. So do tell me, which, which of these meetings do you have? Does anybody have meetings with their family? Get the whole family together and have a meeting about something. Maybe, or not, if not your family, maybe your housemates or your flatmates. We need to have a meeting about cleaning the washing machine. Nobody is cleaning. Let's have a meeting. Do you do that? Um, what about... Uh, you might have a meeting with clients or customers, so people outside of your business, um, meeting with new clients, trying to sell your business perhaps. I also think we have networking meetings. This might be an event, a networking event, when you meet lots of new people. Networking is when we meet people through, for business or meet lots of new people, make new connections. Which of these meetings do you have? Please let me know. Let's see. Um, this is an English meeting, says Paco. It is. This is a meeting all about English. Um, ah, okay. Interesting. Um, so, Fletzania has said that sometimes you have to do networking with the manager or it's impolite. You have to go with meetings to be polite. Very good, very good. Um, Mariano has meetings with teachers. Um, Marina, I like meeting with teachers. Good. Um, meeting in the classroom. What else we've got? Irina. Hi, Irina. Irina says, our meetings happen to solve some urgent issues as well as to share with colleagues what was done for the last week. And it's a total waste of time. <laughs> I didn't read that last sentence. She says it's a total waste of time. Okay. So it sounds like you maybe have weekly work meetings. Yeah. What have we done this week? What have we achieved? Good. Who else? Nasser. Hi, Nasser. Nice to see you. Okay. He's just joined us. What meetings do you have? A and F. So business meetings and meetings with clients. Good. Marina would like more meetings with teachers. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, what meetings do I have? Well, because I'm an English teacher uh, on italki, it means I'm 
I work on my own. So I don't really have work meetings, um, but I do have meetings with I do have meet B meetings with accountants and landlords. So uh, I do that. I I am a teacher, but I don't really I don't have children, so I don't meet with teachers about that. Um, I do have family meetings. I like a family meeting. I think it's a good idea. Um, meetings with clients, yeah, definitely, and maybe networking meetings. Maybe I used to have a lot more meetings in my previous lifetime before I was a teacher. Um, oh, look, someone else says they like family meetings. And brilliant, Sa Saeed says I like meetings to touch base on something. Very good. We're going to we're going to use that idiom later, actually. So I'm glad you know that one. Excellent. So he says, every spring I have a family meeting at the garden to plant potatoes. Oh, that's a beautiful idea. So every year you bring your family together and, and, and then um, plant, plant potatoes. Wonderful. We just, Nancy says, in Italy, we just have lunch together. We don't have a meeting. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So we're going to um, talk about First of all, the agenda. So this is for a business meeting. This isn't really a meeting that you would have perhaps with your family or with a teacher. We're thinking about a business meeting now. And what the agenda is the plan for the meeting. You might think of it as the itinerary or the list of what you're going to do. At work, when we have meetings, when we have formal meetings, we must write an agenda first and probably we should send it to everybody before the meeting. So we have to write the agenda. Here I have the sections of the meeting and I want you to tell me what is the correct order. So this is in the wrong order. We don't start with questions and answers and we don't end with the schedule for next month. We don't start here and we don't end here. It's in the wrong order. So can you tell me the correct order for the agenda? I will read them out while you think so that you can hear my pronunciation. And I'll just check some of the vocabulary as we go through. But this is a general business meeting agenda. So A is questions and answers. I think you understand that, but tell me if you don't know what it means. B a presentation, background to the project and project aims. What are aims? Aims is another word for goals, what the project will achieve. Um, and a presentation is when one person talks or perhaps two or three people speak, but it isn't a conversation, it's a prepared presentation. C is action points. Do you know that word? That's a bit of a business vocabulary, action points. Actions or action points or next steps. This is when we talk about what will we do after the meeting? So now we have had the meeting, we decide what is happening next. What next? Um, so we might say, oh, after this meeting, I don't know, Nancy is going to learn five new vocabulary points and Anna is going to write a report on um, the presentation. And these are the action points. OK. D, attendance and apologies. Perhaps, you know, attendance. We often say this in the classroom. Attendance. Who is here? But apologies is a meeting specific word. Apologies means who isn't here and why. So if you can't go to a meeting, you send your apologies. I'm so sorry, I have to send my apologies. I can't come to the meeting because it's, uh, I have to go to the dentist maybe. So we say, our, who, who sent apologies? AOB, another business word, AOB means any other business. This is when anybody in the meeting can say, something else, something that isn't on the agenda. And then the schedule for next month's meeting. Okay, have a look. Does anybody know what order this should be in? So you can just type the letters. If you think D is first or C is first, you can write C, B, E, A, D, F, whatever you want. We have some more comments about meetings. 
Hi, Anna. Hi. Um, I used to have very long meetings in my jobs and most of the time they're a waste of time. Just people speaking, but not really solving problems. Good. Okay. Um, hi, Erica. Hello. You've sent in your answers. You've put D-B-A-C-E-F. Okay, cool. Has anybody else got a guess of what they think the correct order is? What do you think is first? Erica has said D, attendance and apologies. Do you agree? Does that come first? I'm going to take a water. Yes. Irina and Marina have also said D first. Um, Grazia has put B first, the presentation. Nasser, D, B. Okay, good. Thank you. Great. Claudia, thank you. Hi, Claudia. Um, Serki, D. Okay, we've got a lot of people saying D first. Let's have a look. You're correct. The first one is D, attendance and apologies. That's the first thing you do. Who is here? Of course, if you have somebody taking minutes, this is really important. Taking minutes means writing down everything in the meeting and you start with attendance and apologies in the minutes. So the person writing the minutes needs, needs to write down who is there. B, presentation. Okay, next is B. So then we would say the presentation. Perhaps this meeting is about a new project. Uh, A, questions and answers. Then action points schedule for next meeting and any other business. Let's see, most people put F last. Okay, I think, uh, so I'm looking at your answers and most people put F last. I think you are right. I think it could be F E or E F. So you might do um, any other business before the schedule for the next meeting. Um, I think that's very common. So I think you did quite well there. Yeah, most people seem to have more or less the same. Here we put the action points last. The action points is after this part of the meeting because the action points are usually what you decide in this part of the meeting. So if a question and the answers you say, Oh, um, who, how will we say the project is about printing books? In the question and answers, you might say, how will we print the books? And you say, I don't know. Claudia, will you find out? And Claudia says, OK, so that's an action point. So the action point comes after the discussion because it's the decisions of what people are doing next, what we will do next. OK, good. Oh, Fletzania says it's too difficult. All right. Well, hopefully now you see the answer. It helps a little bit. These are the sixth steps. Um, but maybe you'll find the next exercise better. Uh, okay. So this is a common agenda. What I wanted to do now is instead of looking at the agenda, start looking at the language we use in meetings. Now, you probably know at work, we do speak differently to how we normally speak with our friends or family. Very often people like to sound a bit more formal. Perhaps they use vocabulary that sounds a bit more important. Um, and we often use business idioms or business slang. So here I just thought of some really common ones that maybe you know but are quite good for meetings, some really common idioms. If you don't know what an idiom is, uh, it, it's a word where it, it doesn't mean what it literally says, an idiom. It's a turn of phrase or a common phrase um, that we use in English. In English, we love idioms. Maybe you know the idiom, it's raining cats and dogs. That's a very common idiom that people learn. Or in English, we do say, if we don't like something, that is not my cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea. That's another common idiom. Maybe you know that one. Well, these are some business idioms. I think I've actually, there we go. Okay, on this one, I've got the letters. This is easier, isn't it? So you can match the letters to the numbers. So the idioms are, what do you think these mean? Going forward, Think outside the box, touch base, end of play. 
what do you think each of those idioms means? We're going to go through the meaning, um, but first I'm going to read the sentences. So number one, we need some creativity. Come on, everyone. Number two, I understand this week has been difficult, but we need to focus on the positives. Yeah. Oh, that's a very common <laughs> sentence at work. This week has been difficult. This month has been difficult. Probably a lot of businesses are saying now. Number three, hey, I have been meaning to chat to you all week. Can we tomorrow? Number four, I know it's already 3 p.m., but I need this work done quickly. Can you get it to me by blank? Okay, let's have a look. People are sending their guesses in. Ooh, very good. Okay, got somebody saying 1B. Yeah. A, B from Nasser. Put the, it, when you put your answers in, put the numbers by the letters if you want me to check your answers so I know what you're, what you're saying there. Excellent. Anna's done it. 1B. Great. 1B. Okay, good. You're correct. Um, we need some creativity. Come on, everyone. Think outside the box. So think outside the box is an idiom which means to think creatively. When you think inside the box, you only have all the same ideas, do things the same way that you've always done it, all the old ways of doing it, traditional ideas. When we go outside of the box, we stop thinking with limitations and we think all over the place, new ideas. Think outside the box. Good. What have people put for two? Okay, we've got 2C as a guess. We've got 2A from Erica. Thank you, Nasa. 2B. Uh, 2A, 2A. Okay, what's the context here? This week has been difficult. So we're saying has been, we've got the perfect tense, all right, the past. This week has been difficult, but then the phrase, we need to focus on the positives. So this sentence has a contrast between the past and the future. The week has been difficult in the past, we need to focus on the positives, the present or future. So we need a term that's going to contrast the past with the present or future. And so the answer is going forward. Going forward or going forwards, you could also say, just means from now on, uh, from now. Yeah, now we need to focus on the positives or as we carry on, we need to focus on the positives. So good. I think some people got that, but some people may be confused with going forward and touch base. So what does touch base mean? Touch base is an idiom that comes from baseball, the sport where you touch base in baseball. I actually, I don't play baseball, but I think you run around the outside and you run past four bases or three. Perhaps you know baseball better than me, um, but you have to run around the outside of the bases and maybe you touch the bases uh, where the other person is standing. And so touch base means to connect um, or to meet, literally. So what we mean when we say touch base is maybe another phrase would be to catch up, to check how somebody is doing, to check on somebody, to talk to somebody, basically. Let's touch base. Let's talk. And that's why it's number three. Can we touch base tomorrow? Um, number four. So we know number four is then end of play. So that's 4D. People got that? Yeah, so it's 2A. Good. 4D. People have got 4D, excellent. Good, okay, 4D. Um, end of play, again, it's a sports reference. It means the end of the day, the end of the day. I actually didn't know this as an adult. I learned this only last year, I think. People said to me, end of play. And I thought, what? <laughs> when are we playing? But we're not playing. It's a, It's just an idiom. I know it's already 3 p.m., but I need this work by end of play. Good. 
I wonder if I can just give another example with touch base because it's one that some people confuse. So when we say touch base, you might talk about the fact that you spoke to a colleague or a friend. You might say, oh, um, I touched base with my manager yesterday and she said we are doing really well. Yeah, uh, she's really happy or mm, I'm a bit worried about my English progress. I'm going to touch base with my teacher and see if she thinks I should do more homework. I'm going to touch base. Then going forward for a, another example, we could say um, uh, in the past week, you know, or in the past month, you have been late every day. So if somebody is always late, look, you have been late every day for a whole month. Going forwards, you must be on time every day. That's an example. Or another example might be that you say, okay, we have been studying a lot of grammar. I know we've done a lot of grammar in class. So going forwards, we're going to do more speaking. So these are a couple of examples. I hope that helps. Cool. Okay, let's have a look. All right, let me take a sip of water. As we're going through, do send in any questions or if you want me to speak a bit more slowly. Somebody said, ah, what is box? Okay, good. Um, okay, two questions there. So first of all, the first one is what is a box? I'm wondering if I have one. I don't. Well, a box is, imagine you buy some shoes. The shoes come in a box when you buy them. You open the box and there are the shoes. Or maybe you buy chocolates or maybe you order something from Amazon and they send it to you in a box. So a box is usually maybe cardboard or plastic and you put things in it. A box, it's square or rectangular. Um, it's a cube, a box. When else do we say box? Yeah, so that is a box. So when something is inside the box, it's in a container, it's in packaging, but when it's outside, it's free in the open air. Um, and angry S Angie Stone, hi Angie. She says, does touch base mean to study again? Not really, it doesn't necessarily mean to study. Touch base just usually means to catch up with somebody and that means to talk to them. Maybe to talk to them after a while, you might touch base with your manager every month. Once per month, you meet them, you talk to them, you see maybe how they are, you tell them how you are, and you just explain your current situation. And then you don't see them for a month. A month later, you touch base again, you meet again. So it's a word for, it means meet, but when you touch base, you don't have an agenda. It's not a long meeting. It's usually just to explain your current situation, and make sure everything is okay, um, and to check up on somebody. Sometimes instead of a meeting, you might touch base, get a coffee and touch base, or go for a cup of tea or some water to touch base. Good. I hope that helps. Do say if you still don't understand. Okay, great. Thanks, Angie. Any other questions, put them in. Now, the other thing that we do when we have meetings is we have to give our opinions about something. So that's what we're going to look at now, giving our opinions. I'm gonna look at some vocabulary. And as we go through, I really want you to practice by typing some opinions here. So it can be about anything. It could be about meetings, it could be about learning English, it could be about your favourite food. Try to think of something that you have an opinion on and give a comment. I'm also going to say some statements to see if you agree or disagree. Um, but I want you to think about how you give opinions. First, um, we've got some things that you maybe shouldn't say in a meeting. Can you see why these are a bad thing to say to somebody in a meeting? Why would this not be a good idea? 
remember in English we're very we we like to be very polite and when we try to be polite that often means indirect we are not a very direct nation in the UK in my opinion you know I don't think we are very direct and we like to be more polite by being less direct that's usually how it works so what have we got I'm sorry but that is a terrible idea is that direct or indirect it's a bit direct <laughs> um, so this might be something you wouldn't say because it's too strong it's too direct you are always late. That could be a little bit too direct. Can you say that again? I wasn't listening. Um, can't anybody think of a good idea? That obviously won't work. Okay. This isn't, so these two are very direct here. This is why they might, you might not want to say them. And this one too, actually, that obviously won't work. They're too direct. Yeah. That, we've got some uh, some suggestions here. Mariano, it's impolite. Yeah, it's too direct. They can get hurt. Grazia, really good. Yeah, it might hurt somebody's feelings if you say something like this. This one isn't necessarily too direct, but it's a little bit, it's rude because it, it, you tell them that you weren't listening to them. So we should really listen the first time. Um, okay, Marina said a nice alternative. In my opinion, that is not the best idea. Good, that's a nice alternative instead of that is a terrible idea. In my opinion, it's not the best idea, which means it's a bad idea, but it's more polite. Um, and that, that's very important really to be polite at work. Uh, oh, I've got some questions on YouTube. Erica says, are gathering and meeting synonyms? They're similar, but I don't think they're synonyms. Gathering means bringing people together or you might even gather animals together or even clothes or th objects to gather things together. Um, and meeting is always with a person. In terms of nouns, a gathering and a meeting, a gathering suggests it's more informal, it's a big group. So you might have a gathering of your friends, a family gathering. It's usually for pleasure, it's not usually for work. Whereas a meeting is a more formal, organized um, time when you, when you meet somebody, but you have a specific purpose. Uh, so there's a, there's a reason for the meeting. I hope that helps. Um, okay. Oh, we have another example. Um, Mariano, could you please say that again? Yes, that's more polite. Why? Because we've changed can to could. It's more indirect. Lovely use of English there. Thank you. Um, could you repeat that, please, says Elena. Another good idea. Um, Ricardo says, maybe we can say that's a good point of view. But what about definitely that's really good because you say oh that is a good idea but also and then you introduce your new point um okay let's have a look so here's some vocabulary as we go through if you want to practice any sentences present an opinion and then i can agree or disagree with you uh so presenting your opinion i think from my point of view in my opinion when you think about it, it is probably true that, can I suggest? So these are words we might use when we want to present an opinion. So do you want to practice um, saying uh, an opinion on the chat and then I can respond to it? For example, in my opinion, uh, the food in Spain is excellent. Yeah, or from my point of view, the food in Spain is good, um, but I still love English food. Do you love English food? Um, let me know in the comments. Okay, I'm going to show you now um, some agreeing statements, I think. Uh, oh, someone's asked about presenting an opinion. Eduardo has said, how often do you use the verb to reckon? Well, firstly, what does to reckon mean? Well, we usually say, I reckon, when we want to say, I think. I reckon is like saying, I think. 
I don't think I use that word a lot. <laughs> I think I use re- I think I use think more than than I reckon. Um, but I reckon is softer than I think. In I know that in Spanish, I think and I believe are the same word, but they are different in English. We say I believe for when it's very, very strong. It's an internal belief. We often use believe with religion or whether we think something is true or not. Do you believe it? Think is more academic. And then I think reckon is even less, uh, it's softer. That means it is less direct, so it might be more polite in some situations. Mm, I reckon that won't work. I reckon that won't work. It's a more polite way to say, I think that won't work. Do you see? It's a bit less direct. Okay, Uh, (laughs) I think French food is weird, really. Oh my goodness, I love French food. Any other opinions? Nasser says, I like fish and chips. Yes, fish and chips are lovely. Um, Okay, let's look at agreeing. So if you agree with me that English food is wonderful, I love English food, we can say, yes, I agree. Or you're probably right. That's so true. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I think you made a good point. So these are all ways of saying I agree with somebody. Nasser says, I like fish and chips. Nasser, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's so true. Fish and chips are delicious. Um, what who else has got an idea ah ricardo does not agree he thinks french food is excellent so ricardo i think you made a good point french food is excellent um can we use elena says to my mind to my mind i don't think that's correct i think we would say it may be in my mind. Oh, if any Engl- other English teachers are watching, they can <laughs> correct me. Sometimes it's hard to know. Um, I think from from my point of view is the, the correct translation for to my mind. Ah, Aga says, my favorite English food is definitely chicken tikka masala. I think you made a good point, Aga. I love chicken tikka. Oh, it's so good. Um, Serhi says, from my point of view, food in England is a little bit boring. You're probably right. It is a bit traditional English food is a bit boring. I think I love it because I am English. <laughs> Good. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. All right. What about disagreeing? So does anybody disagree with my ideas about English food being the best food? So we can say, no, I disagree. That's quite sharp, really. No, I disagree. So some softer ways, mm, I don't agree with you. It's very, it's still quite direct, but it's a bit more, it's a bit softer. Um, have you thought about, okay. So then we can introduce a new idea to disagree with somebody. Have you thought about French food? Because that is nicer than English food. Or I could say, for example, Serhi says, from my point of view, food in England is a little bit boring. Okay, Serhi. But have you thought about the fact that in the UK, we have food from lots of different countries that's very available? So we have food from India, the Caribbean, Japan, China, African food, uh, North African food, Middle Eastern, even though English food is boring. We do have very good international restaurants. Have you thought about that? Um, Nancy has said, in my opinion, the best food is from Italy. We are the queen of pasta. So can I disagree with that? (laughs) I don't know if I can. I cannot disagree that you are the queen of pasta in Italy. And I understand what you're saying. But I think that that could be good pasta in the UK. I don't actually disagree with you, Nancy. So that's difficult to say. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Um, Erica said, I strongly believe Ecuadorian food is better. Okay. Ah, so what is traditional Ecuadorian food like, Erica? Can you give us an example dish? Um, Because I'm not sure if it's better, but maybe if you give me some more details, I don't think I've ever eaten Ecuadorian food but maybe I should. Somebody says, I prefer pasta to potato. Ah, Nancy, brilliant. I've thought of my way to disagree with you. 
Okay, I understand what you're saying, Nancy, that Italy is the queen of pasta, but, and this is true, I can't eat wheat or gluten. So for me, potatoes are better because I can't eat pasta. Okay. Um, oh, lovely. Okay, let's have a look. Oh, there was one more. Actually, I was thinking we could do something different. Sorry, actually. Actually, I was thinking that we could have Ecuadorian food because I've never had it before and I want to try it. Um, great. Thank you so much for sending in those comments. Okay. I have an opinion here that I want you to try to give your opinion about this statement. All right. Have you ever had a meeting or group call on Skype or Zoom? So at the moment, lots of us are having to stop seeing people or going to meetings and instead see our friends, our family and our, our colleagues as well online. So maybe Skype or Zoom or WeChat, Facebook Messenger or um, WhatsApp, whatever it is, I'm talking about a group video call. Okay. Have you done that at work or with your family? Have you had a group video call? And if you did, what did you like about it and what did you dislike? Can you tell me a good thing or a bad thing about group calls on Zoom? On the next slide, I have nine advantages and disadvantages. And I want to see if you can predict what I wrote. So, so there's nine in total. I think there's five advantages and four disadvantages to group calls with your friends or family on Zoom. This month, I've had a lot of um, group calls with my friends on, um, on Facebook Messenger and on Zoom and with my family on Skype um, and, and WeChat as well. So have you done that? Tell me a good thing or a bad thing about it. Um, oh, somebody, Angie had a job interview on Skype. Okay. So what was good about um, the, having a job interview on Skype? What was a good thing? Or was there a bad thing about it? What did you think about it? Let's see what you think. Um, Anna has said, I can have pasta from Saracen. What is Saracen? Is that a gluten-free uh, grain? <laughs> this is such a useful, these lessons are so useful for me. First, I'm going to try Ecuadorian food and then I'm going to try um, Saracen. Is it like uh, buckwheat maybe? Because in France, I know that they do um, galettes with buckwheat grain and it's wonderful. I've never used Zoom, said Marina. Okay, Marina, you've never used Zoom. Have you used Skype or maybe WhatsApp Messenger to have a video call? We're starting to get some comments about the advantages and disadvantages. Okay. One of the disadvantages is that sometimes internet connection isn't stable. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Mariana says, I like being in touch with people living far from me to have business meetings and staying at home. There's no traffic jams. Okay. Excellent advantage. So you don't have to commute. You don't have to travel to work. Um, Claudia has had lots of meetings with Zoom. The best one is my cousins. It's nice because we can see each other from different parts of Italy and feel more close and feel closer. Yes, definitely. So you can contact with your family on Zoom. Advantages, you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Lovely sentence, Saeed. Um, we can meet friends and make group calls, says Fletzana. Thank you. Sorry, Fletzania. Um, Nasser says, okay, Nasser says, about the job interview in Skype, for the first session, it's perfect to discover the res the, prospect the, the respectives expecting. Do you mean um, what they are expecting of you, perhaps? Yeah, so for the first job interview, it's a good idea. Um, definitely. What are some disadvantages people are saying? Sergio says, Zoom is not secure. So, um, there has been some privacy concerns about Zoom. That's a good disadvantage. Data security. Uh, it's not secure. It's prohibited in work, big companies. Okay. Oh, lots of concerns about Zoom security. Um, Zoom is quite easy. Okay, good. We've got a lot. Let's see if anybody 
has got the same ones that I've got. So online meetings. These were the ones I came up with. I put it in a bingo grid so that maybe you can see if you can get bingo. Did you get bingo? All right. You can join the meeting from anywhere in the world. I think maybe Claudia said that, you know, you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Somebody said and Claudia said you can connect with people from different parts of Italy. These are the advantages in green. Meetings online are often shorter than face-to-face -face meetings. So maybe that is an advantage if you don't like meetings. Meeting online means we could work from home. Yep, so no commuting. Online meetings are the only way to have meetings during coronavirus. Um, it is better than a conference call because you can see people's faces. Yeah, have you ever had a conference call where it's just on the phone? You can't see the people. Sometimes that's harder because you don't know who is speaking. It's so confusing. Um, who else is saying, I've never done work meeting by Skype, but always use WhatsApp to keep in touch with my family because I don't live with them. Yeah, wow, WhatsApp is so good if you live in a different country. Nancy, me too. I use WhatsApp a lot as well. Let's look at the disadvantages in purple. Sometimes it is hard to understand what people are saying. I don't know if that's just me, but I find it harder to hear what people are saying sometimes. You have to have a very good internet connection or it doesn't work. We got that. We definitely said that one. It is difficult to show people presentations or documents. Well, actually on Skype or Zoom, you can share your screen and you can show presentations but you can't always show printed documents in the same way and you can't have people write on it with pens. So maybe that makes it more difficult. There is less time to chat to people and to gossip. This is a disadvantage for me because I like to gossip, but maybe if you hate small talk and gossiping in meetings, this is actually a good thing that we have shorter meetings because we don't spend time gossiping. Uh, let's have a look what have people said. <laughs> Serhi says Zoom meeting is cool because you can eat garlic before the meeting so it doesn't matter if you have garlicky breath and you smell like garlic. Yeah that's true it doesn't matter if you smell. <laughs> that is an advantage if you want to smell. That's funny. Um, advantage you can mute. Olivier, Olivier has said this is a huge scandal. The advantage is you can mute a colleague. A mute is when you turn off their microphone. Olivier, that is awful. <laughs> you can't do that. Um, uh, good. Anything else here that we have? All right, you might mute a colleague. Elena says you're a gossip. Yeah, it's true. I like to gossip. I like to gossip more than working, I think. That's why I like meetings, but I think that everybody else in this class likes to work, so they, they don't like the meetings. Uh, okay, so we thought about this one, agree or disagree. Let's have a look at some quotes. Meetings are a waste of time, agree or disagree. I agree with you. Meetings are too long and I already have so much work to do. Or to disagree, actually, I like meetings. I find them useful. So can, we can use actually to contradict somebody. That's quite nice. Um, and then I have to say I don't agree. These days we spend too much time emailing each other. Meetings are a good chance to actually speak to each other. And I think that is true. I like to speak to people, not just email. Um, so what do you think? Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I think we already know. I think you do agree. Um, okay. It is easy to think of new ideas in meetings because everybody can work together. Now, this is a reason. Sorry. This is a reason that I like meetings because I like to share ideas with people, and I think you have better ideas when you are in a group. When you work on your own, it's really hard to think of good ideas, I find. But with a group, you can have uh, new ideas together. So I totally agree. I love to share my ideas with other people and create new projects. Do you like to have ideas with new people? Brainstorm, yeah, exactly. Um, or do you disagree? That may be true to some extent, but I prefer to work alone. Maybe you do, okay. Um, let's have a look, yes, brainstorm. I eat all the time, good. Um, 
Yeah, so Erica says, I like Zoom, it's practical and we can share resources like videos and slides. You're right, we can do that. And so it is easy to share documents and, and um, presentations on, on, uh, on Zoom and on um, Skype. Okay, I got some other useful phrases here for you that I thought you might like. And these phrases are just that you can use in meetings if you want to encourage somebody. Maybe if you are the chair of the meeting and you want someone to talk more, you can say, it is, isn't it? Or I would love to, wouldn't you? I would love to redesign this project, wouldn't you? It is a lot of work, isn't it? This can help to encourage somebody. Um, cool, okay, well, I think we've come to the end of class time. So perhaps you know that this is the final week, I believe, of the live stream. Um, my last class is going to be on Friday morning and I think we're going to be looking a little bit at job interviews again. Um, but I really hope you found the classes useful. As you know, all of the teachers that do these classes are also working um, on italki as teachers doing one-to-one -one classes. And I think that italki has a code at the moment that you can use if you want to get $10 off your first purchase. So that's quite good. Um, but we are at the end of class. So thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to see you all and see some more people again. Please let me know if anything was useful or if you want different topics on Friday. And I hope to see you all on Friday or very soon, if not. Thank you. Bye. I'm from the US, I'm a chemical engineer, and I'm passionate about language learning. I've used italki to learn eight languages to a conversational level. I grew up in Colorado, where I was exposed to many different cultures, which cultivated my interest in languages. One of the first languages I became conversational in was Norwegian. I decided to book a trip to Norway. To prepare, I found a group class with around seven people. Not only were they extremely expensive, it was around $40 to $50 per lesson, Progress was also frustratingly slow due to the size of the class. I heard about italki from a positive view from a famous polyglot. I was amazed to discover that I could learn any language I want, one-on-one, -on -one, and for the fraction of the price as offline classes. I thought, how is this even possible? I immediately signed up with two teachers in Norwegian. One teacher would have conversation lessons and go through a textbook, and with the other teacher, we would go through worksheets and chat about random things. So essentially, I structured the classes in a way that would suit my own learning style, which never would have happened without me talking. Within a year, I was relatively fluent in Norwegian. I was so happy that I could actually go to the country and use the language in a practical setting. And the best part is I really enjoyed the learning process. I thought, why stop there? I picked up Italian and mixed my interest in Italian cooking with lessons on italki. After learning Italian for a year and going to Northern Italy, I was able to easily get around and communicate with people. I then decided to set myself a personal goal of passing an advanced Italian exam and my teacher on italki helped me to achieve this. I was hooked. I'd found the ultimate formula for learning a language from scratch and staying motivated. I would book a holiday in a new country in one year's time so that I could put the language into practice. I did the same with Japanese, French, German, Russian, Czech, and Hungarian, and even explored Chinese, Thai, Serbian, Farsi, and Sicilian. From this process, I made so many valuable friendships and connections that has improved not only my communication, but also my confidence. Whether I'm watching the news in German, reading about Italian politics, Norwegian, on the phone to my friends in Bergen, or watching fitness and nutrition videos in Czech, I find a way to get at least some practice of one of the languages every day. I found the best way to stay motivated is to align my interests with my language learning, and in that way it doesn't take over my whole life, which people often believe. I find this way of learning on italki so much fun.
Lingvi es una aplicación móvil que ayuda a practicar idiomas de manera instantánea conectando a usuarios disponibles en todo el mundo. Con Lingvi las personas nativas dispuestas a ayudarte a practicar el idioma que desees aprender. Los usuarios con tiempo libre se mostrarán disponibles para recibir llamadas y de esta forma ganarán recompensas ayudando a otros usuarios. Así es como conectamos personas de forma colaborativa y gratuita en nuestra aplicación. Únete a nuestra comunidad, haz nuevos amigos y mejora en todos los idiomas que quieras. Descarga Lingvi y practiquemos juntos. Este es Peter. Está aprendiendo chino. Ha intentado estudiar por su cuenta con libros, tarjetas de vocabulario y aplicaciones móviles, pero sigue teniendo problemas para hablar. Esta es María. Le encanta aprender inglés, pero no tiene oportunidades para ponerlo en práctica. Con italki, Peter y María pueden recibir clases personales online para hablar con fluidez en otro idioma. Tú también puedes aprender un idioma en italki. Empieza hoy en tres simples pasos. Primero, elige un idioma. Inglés, alemán, chino, francés, japonés... Aitoki tiene profesores para cualquier idioma. Segundo, escoge un profesor. Con Aitoki puedes escoger entre miles de profesores con experiencia de todo el mundo. Tercero, elige el horario de tu lección. Las clases de idiomas online son el mejor método para aprender con profesores nativos. Con Aitoki tendrás un profesor de idiomas personal y conversaciones reales con hablantes nativos. Cada día miles de personas aprenden con profesores internacionales a través de Aitoki. Encuentra un profesor hoy y domina el idioma de tu lección. Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today we will be talking about three grammar rules to follow when you start learning Spanish. The first one is that as you have already heard, Spanish verbs are always conjugated. That means that they have to match with the subject of the sentence. For example, there are different pronouns in Spanish. Yo, tú, él, ella, usted, nosotros, nosotras, vosotros, vosotras, and ellos, ellas, y usted. All these pronouns have their own conjugations, and it's very common for beginners to mix them up. So remember this. When you start to conjugate the verbs, they have to match. The second rule is very important as well. The Spanish nouns and adjectives has to be in the same level. Let me explain you this. If you have a noun that is feminine and plural, for example, las mujeres, the adjective that you have to use right after the noun has to be feminine and plural as well. For example, las mujeres españolas. It is the same with the articles as female and plural. We use this article because, as I say, it's female and plural. The third rule I already mentioned before, and be careful, English speakers, because the adjectives in Spanish go after the noun, not before like in English. This is very common for uh, students that learn Spanish and already speak or know English. When I say it, las mujeres españolas, españolas is the adjective, and I put it after las mujeres. In English, it would be a Spanish woman, but not in Spanish. Okay, there are some occasions where the adjectives go before the nouns. That is true, but normally this use comes out at intermediate level or advanced level. So do not worry when you are a beginner. Thanks for watching this video. And don't forget to subscribe to the italki YouTube channel over here. Take a lesson with me on italki.com by clicking on my teacher profile link in the description. Hasta luego. Hi everyone, it's Vicente and I teach Spanish on italki.com and today we're talking about seven Spanish words that are similar to their English counterpart. These words are also known as cognates. What a cognate is? A cognate is a word that has the same linguistic derivation that another word and it looks similar and when you pronounce it, it sounds almost the same. And here, I will give you seven cognates 
So you can use them in Spanish as well. The first one is alcohol in Spanish. I guess you know what it means. Sounds pretty similar than in English, doesn't it? Number two is conclusión. This one has a different pronunciation in Spanish, but you will understand definitely when you start learning Spanish. Number three, three, <laughs> hobby. This one is completely similar. We basically took this word from... It is you're trying to achieve. So always keep sight of the big picture. The second idiom is to go the extra mile. Now imagine you're in an interview and the interviewer says to you that they are looking for someone who always goes the extra mile. What does that mean? Does it mean they want you to run around the office every day? No, it means they want you to do more than just what is in the job description. They want you to go that little bit further and to take on extra responsibilities. That is going the extra mile. The third idiom is a win-win situation. A win-win situation means everybody gains something. A really good example of this is these videos that I'm making for italki italki gains some content for their website some lessons and i have a platform where students can see me and book lessons with me it's a win-win italki wins and caroline wins the fourth idiom is word of mouth 
So an example of this is think about how you found out about I. Did you find italki by search terms? It can be positive or it can be negative. If your company gets bad word of mouth, it is going to be a very difficult time for your company because people really listen to the opinions of their friends. So make sure whatever you do, you have good word of mouth about it. The fifth and final business idiom is to touch base. My manager used to say this to me a lot. To touch base means to have a very quick and short meeting about a project or something that you are working on. It might only be five minutes of your time, but in that time, you will check that you Hello, everyone, and welcome. Greetings to everyone who's joining us today for our uh, day two this week of uh, live streaming lessons. Guys, we only have four more days left in this activity. so. Be sure to check out the calendar that is listed in this page. You can, of course, preview the classes that are going to be offered in the coming days. So welcome to everyone, Elena and Ole. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. I see we have some people joining us on our YouTube page as well. Uh, Erika, welcome back. Uh, Sylvia is also joining us there, and Nasser here yesterday. So welcome to everyone. Uh, so I'd just like to know where are you from and what was your most recent meal? It's a bit boring talking about what time is it where you are, how's the weather. So tell me what was your most recent meal and where are you from? Um, and thank you for all your kind greetings. Gracia, Aga, Gabriela, Sergio, uh, Marina, nice to see you all. Um, and what is your last meal? So I'm here in the United States. Right now it is 9.16 in the morning. My latest meal was breakfast, of course. So I had a nice bowl of oatmeal, which I love very much, oatmeal for breakfast. And uh, also uh, several cups of coffee. And I have here a banana. A very nice banana. Look at this banana. Doesn't it look delicious? I can't wait to eat it. Uh, waiting for me for, for my second breakfast. What was your uh, latest meal? So I see someone from Poland just had vegan lentil soup. Oof, delicious. Uh, Virginia says my last meal was uh, chicken and Coca-Cola. Gulia, Gulia is uh, writing that meat dumplings. Uh, that must have been lunch. Gabriela from Switzerland writes that her latest meal was pizza, homemade, excellent. So Gabriela, did you make the crust also? Um, Irina is only having tea. Irina, what's going on? Are you on a diet or do you just really not want to prepare lunch today? Um, and we have someone joining us from Germany, from Barcelona. So maybe if you're in Barcelona, you had some Panam Tomaket, Erika is writing about tea, bread, and eggs. That sounds very good. Uh, and a Polish poppy roll. Marina, what is a Polish poppy roll? Nancy had a salad. That seems very nice as well. Um, Ingrid writes that she had a, uh, ah, a Spanish omelet, uh, cheese and arepa. So that sounds like another good uh, meal. That must be my student, Ingrid. Uh, let me know, Ingrid, if that's you, eating tortilla española. And then Elena is writing that she had buckwheat and porridge. Wonderful, okay. Uh, so, and it looks like Nancy says she's on a diet. Okay, I can understand that. My mother's currently on a diet, talking to me a lot about her diet. It's a good thing to do, of course, we have a lot of time right now to learn different things. You're trying to learn English. I'm trying to learn a new instrument. Uh, maybe you're trying to learn about a new diet uh, as well. So Elena, ah, Elena is writing okay. And Raphael says my latest dinner was shrimp fried rice. 
Raphael, where are you joining us from? Is this Korean Raphael or Raphael from a different place? And Kiki had kimchi soup. Well, welcome everyone. You're making me hungry. I, as I mentioned, I have an apple waiting here for me. It's just like making direct eye contact with me as I do this live stream, but I won't get distracted with my apple. <laughs> hey, Raphael, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. Uh, so Nancy's asking what kind of fish I have. This must be the fish on the wall. Surprisingly, Nancy, you're one of the first students asking me about this fish. It's not for lunch. However, if we continue speaking about all this delicious food you're eating, I might have to take the fish down and, and eat it myself. Uh, but this is a fish that my father caught on a fishing trip, uh, I believe in the Caribbean uh, or uh, in the Atlantic, that area, a swordfish. So you can see it's got this sword uh, and that's what it uses to hunt. It's, it spears the fish that it wants to eat. So welcome everyone, uh, nice chatting. We're going to do a quick numbers challenge today. Uh, so let's see if I can get my presentation. There we go, it's now full screen. So you should see in just a few moments my, uh, my, my numbers challenge. What we're going to do in today's numbers challenge is uh, see the numbers on the screen. So those of you who've joined me before in these live streaming classes are used to just hearing the number. Today we're going to see the number as well, okay? Uh, so no excuses on doing anything uh, and getting any incorrect answers here, but let's see how you're doing. And Danielle and Kiki, yes, I love fish very much. So let's begin with our, uh, our numbers challenge. And I see we have someone, yes, indeed, from Barcelona eating pan am tomaquet, delicious. So our first number, 87, write it in the chat box now. Write that number in the chat box, number 87. Of course, we always start with something, uh, something very easy. 87 is our first number. I imagine everyone will get this uh, correct. And hello from Brazil, uh, Ivo is saying, excellent job, everyone. Great. Okay, next number, 102. 102 is our next number. Who's going to get it? The first answer. I see Rafael, Daniel, Nancy, Kiki, Angie, Ingrid, Kiki. Again, a lot of correct answers rolling in. Oh, let's try again. Um, Rafael, well done. Maite, excellent job. Beatriz, Alessandra, nice job. Uh, over on YouTube, Domi, Matur, and Lucia, and Erika, Giovanni, and Ivo are also getting this correct. 102. Our next number. 780. Our next number is 780. Who's going to get this right? 780 is our next number. Ole, nice correction. Beatriz and Elena are the first ones getting it. We've also got Lucia, Carmen, Fer, Maite again. Um, a lot of participation today. I'm so happy to see that everyone is getting our numbers correct. 780. Okay, our next number is 406. Go ahead, guys, give an attempt at this number, 406. Uh, let's see who can get it right. Um, and if, okay, if you feel that your connection is slow, uh, then perhaps do not look at the chat box if you feel your connection is slow. Um, I know we all have different connections here. In fact, I do know uh, Raphael, uh, my student who's joining us once told me that his internet connection is 500 megabytes per second. Isn't that incredible? So Raphael, you have no excuses at, uh, at slow answers, right? Isn't that right, everyone? Uh, what's your internet speed, by the way? Let's see if we can get that number right. Write your internet speed followed by Mbps. My internet speed here is 300 Mbps. What is your internet speed. Uh, we already know that Raphael has got 500 Mbps, but uh, what is your internet speed? Write that down now. That'll be another another number we can see. Uh, so then we've got lots of good correct answers there. 406. 
So while you're looking at your internet speed, let's move on. We've got 10 numbers today. The next number, 9,080. 9,080. Our next number is 9,080. And it seems that a lot of people are not familiar with their internet speed. Uh, that's interesting. Of course, during the quarantine, I think that we're really testing the internet. Uh, I know italki, I believe, has improved their website usability and servers. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that's the case in many other websites. So we've got lots of good answers rolling in. Domi, Ivo, Giovanni, Erika, Maite, Marina, Sergio, Beatriz, Daniel, Eleonora, Grazia. Excellent job. Um, now I saw some incorrect answers. We do have some uh, problems with zeros in these previous live stream classes. Take a look there uh, at the letter A. This is the correct answer, uh, 9080. The majority of, uh, of, of answers are correct. And Martina is saying, is it possible that the speed is five megabytes per second? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe someone else here knows. If you know if that's a possible speed, I believe it's it's possible, but quite slow. Uh, then 1700 is our next uh, number in our number challenge. Write that in the chat now. Let's see who can get it first. 1700 is our next uh, our next number. I think everyone is doing speed tests. <laughs> Everyone is testing their Wi-Fi now. <laughs> okay, good. So we've got some good uh, answers rolling in. Um, some people look to be a bit confused about this. So this might be a new number for some of you. Uh, this is also 1,700, but we can also call this 1700. We use this format for numbers between 1100 and, uh, and I guess 1100 uh, to maybe, maybe up to 5,000. It begins to sound weird above 5,000, but we could say 1700. We could say, for example, 1500, 1500. Yeah, 1,510, we could say 1,510. But I see lots of correct answers here. Well done, guys, 1,700. I did see a few answers that were uh, 170. I saw a few answers that were 17,000, but make sure that you've got this one correct. We're gonna move on to our seventh, getting more complicated, 100. 80,070, 180,070. And um, I'm just reading your comments here. Uh, Ivo is telling me that I've pronounced his name with a perfect accent. Ivo, where are you from? Um, and then we have another name which I cannot pronounce, T-X-I-O. Uh, I'm interested to know how I would pronounce your name. Um, and then we have lots of nice answers coming in. On YouTube, guys, no correct answers on YouTube yet. Uh, and then uh, let's see, we have uh, a lot of correct answers coming in on our landing page, but still some incorrect answers. Uh, Angel, Erika, Lucia, try again. Uh, this one, 100. 80,070. So remember, I'm trying to challenge you, especially with zeros. I really am trying to challenge you with zeros today. So let's take a look at the correct answer. Um, and still on YouTube, guys, I'm not seeing any correct answers on YouTube. And then we've got one, finally, a correct answer here on YouTube. Well done. Lots of correct answers on the landing page. 180. 070. Yeah, 180,070. A recommendation. Use commas in your numbers, just as you're seeing here. 
it's going to make it easier for you to follow what you're saying. So on our next one, use commas because we have lots of places, lots of decimal places. Well, lots of uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, etc. So the next one, seven million sixty-four thousand and eight. Seven million sixty-four thousand and eight. 7,064,008. So it looks like Virginia and Beatriz have blazing fast internet. Well done, guys, or gals, I should say. And we've got lots of correct answers rolling in on YouTube. And several of you following my advice using commas, using periods or spaces. Um, uh, on YouTube, try this again, guys. Try again on YouTube. Uh, but Gabriela, Irina, Rafaela, Ingrid, Aga, Sarah, all getting this correct. The correct answer, of course, 7064008. And we've finally got some correct answers rolling in on YouTube. Maite, well done. Martina as well. Okay, next, number nine, two more. Let's finish this because we have emails we need to write today, right? We're here for an email workshop. So number nine. 48,407, 48,407. That's our next uh, number challenge. Let's see who's getting it right, correct. I'll say it a few more times. 48,407, 48,407. Mantenor, excellent job. We've got, uh, let's see, hello, Sarah and Carmen and Aga, Irina, Alexandre and Diana and Rafaela, among others, um, getting this correct. Excellent job for everyone. 48,407 is 48,000,407. So we have some number champions today. Uh, we're going to do one more. 86 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,900,006. 86,
with phrasal verbs. Uh, yesterday and in previous days that we've worked with phrasal verbs, I've seen lots of threes and twos, but today I'm seeing lots of sevens, lots of fives. I think I see a minus four. <laughs> I don't know if that's a negative four or a positive four, but I like the humor. I like the humor if it's a negative four. We have some threes, some sevens. Um, let's see, someone up here is saying, um, Gabriela says, 10 with the antidote. Okay, fine. Uh, da, 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 um, and, it, and Angie says that it depends on the situation. Exactly. I can understand that. Danka says 7 out of 10, mostly because of traveling. Uh, so guys, this is going to be a really interesting level, uh, excuse me, a really interesting workshop today, because we're going to work on maybe two emails, depending on how much time we have. Uh, however, remember every day I'll be giving a workshop. If we don't complete all of our emails today, then we'll certainly pick up tomorrow. Uh, so this is important for you guys because in the quarantine, we're doing a lot more written communication with colleagues. A lot of my students are saying to me that they're spending much more time emailing and of course having video conferences. Uh, so I hope that this lesson is useful for you. Before we start writing our emails, let's take a look at the email uh, we, we worked at, uh, we worked on in our last workshop, okay? So this is kind of the goal for today is for us to write an email with a situation. So here's a sample email with some uh, notes that I've left. So for example, your company hasn't paid you on time. Write an email to your boss asking for information. So this is the scenario that I'll give you. Every email has a scenario and some relevant information that we'll use to make the written email. So this is the email we wrote together in uh, a workshop last week, I believe on Thursday. Let's take a look. Dear Mr. Smith, I hope you are doing well. I'm emailing you because I haven't received my payroll transfer yet. Maybe there was some issue with last month's salary, or perhaps there was some problem with the payment. Could you please check with the payroll team? Best regards, Laura. Best regards, Laura. So let's take a look here uh, at the things that this email does really well. So first of all, the salutation is very polite, dear Mr. Smith, but also they begin by saying, I hope you're doing well. So I think this is a really great way to begin any email because uh, we're, when we ask, how are you, we don't really expect the person to answer. We're asking rhetorically, but this is a polite way of greeting. And instead of asking, how are you saying, I hope you're well, I hope you are doing well. Now, um, I also really appreciate when students and other people state the purpose of their email. Yeah. At the beginning of the email. Now, our subject line for an email is not the purpose of the email. I think the subject line should always be more related to why the person should open this email. For example, uh, a subject line here could be help with last month's payment. For example, last month's payment not received. But I think it's important to always repeat the statement of your purpose in the email. I'm emailing you because is a great way to begin that. So in the case of uh, Laura's email, she says, I'm emailing you because I haven't received my payroll transfer yet. Maybe there was some issue with last month's salary or perhaps there was some problem with the payment. So we state our purpose and we also give supporting details. Yeah, state our purpose. The email would sound rude if we don't include that. I haven't received my payroll transfer yet, yeah? So I think we need to continue 
to give some supporting details, even though it's logical, one sentence makes a lot of difference to not make it sound a bit rude. And yes, Martina, uh, email is a verb. And I see Kiki is also agreeing with me on some of these, uh, these communicative functions. Thank you, Kiki, for that. And then of course, we need to also give a request for this email. Could you please is a very polite way of saying like, quiero que hagas, necesito que hagas tal cosa. Could you please check with the payroll team is a very polite way of making your request. So that's going to be it for this email. We're going to do a similar exercise and now I need you to help me write the email. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to send you some uh, information uh, and I'm going to type some information, but I want you guys to help me with the majority of the email. You'll be using the chat box for this, so get your fingers ready. Let's take a look at the email workshop situation two. Uh, here's the situation description, and here's some information we need in our email. So let's imagine we're in our office and a client is in town and you would like to arrange a social meeting. Write your client and invite him to a dinner. Suggest a restaurant with local cuisine. So a client of ours, an important client is in town. We have a friendly relationship with this person. We want to meet for dinner, okay? So our client's name is Mr. Jacobs, John Jacobs. We last saw each other, well, you and Mr. Jacobs last saw each other at a conference. You have a friendly relationship. You've heard he's in town for the rest of the, the week. Now, our tone needs to be kind, but personal, but professional. We don't want it to sound like a WhatsApp message. We don't want to use emojis. We want our tone to be kind, personal, but professional. And we want to invite him to meet any kind. We want to invite him to meet any evening and leave our cell phone number for contact. So I see many of you are saying, dear Mr. Jacobs, dear John, uh, what do you think? How should we begin our email? Let's take a vote. Dear Mr. Jacobs is going to be option one. And dear John is going to be option two. Yeah, vote now in the chat box. Type the number one or the number two. We'll do a vote. Of course, remember our relationship is friendly. However, we want to maintain a kind tone that's personal but professional. In the chat box now, vote either for option one or for option two to determine which is going to be better used. We'll take a tally of the votes visually and understand which option we want to do. So I see lots of people are voting for number one. We've got a few people writing also for number two. Um, I think that also number one is uh, is a good uh, a good way to 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 do these. Honestly, there's no bad option here. Neither vote one or vote two are incorrect. But we have to think how frequently do we speak to this person? Yeah, is our relationship one of boss? And, um, and an employee, or is it a friendly uh, conversation? And I think it's really important to think also, if I'm at dinner with this person, how would I call them? Well, personally, if it's my client, I would want to call this person Mr. Jacobs. And then at some point, Mr. Jacobs would likely say to me, no, no, please call me John. Or he would call me by my last name, Mr. Ray. So let's use option one here. I think that this is a good way to start your communication. Um, remember that also we, we have a friendly relationship, but we haven't seen each other for a while. So since we haven't been in frequent contact, I think that uh, saying dear Mr. Jacobs or hi Mr. Jacobs is fine. So Raphael's asking is hi a little bit rude. I think hi would be a little bit, not rude, but misplaced misplaced here because we're being very casual and then formal. Uh, I think hi John would be uh, appropriate, but hi Mr. Jacobs 
could possibly be a bit not rude, but the high is misplaced. So let's say, dear Mr. Jacobs, I hope you're doing well. Good. And then Evo is writing. I really like exactly what I was hoping someone would write. I hope you're well. I heard you are in town for the rest of the week. Yeah. Um, and then I see Diana is writing. How do you do these days? Now, how do you do is extremely formal. And I would recommend don't use that for an email. Uh, use that, you know, for very formal events, for weddings, for balls or galas, for expensive fundraisers. Um, so I would recommend keep <clears throat> keep how do you do reserved for formal situations. Martina's writing, I hope that you're doing well since the last time we saw each other at the conference. Yeah. Now, Martina, maybe you can try that again and use present perfect since you're talking about past accumulated uh, time. I've heard that you are in town this week, so I think that we can meet if you would like to. Good. So Martina, same recommendation. In your first one, you should use present perfect. In your second example, you should use uh, past simple. I heard that you are in town. Just as we've got here in the example, I heard you are in town for the rest of the week. Um, yeah, and Alessio is asking this question. I think I heard is is better here because we're talking about one past moment. If if you say, for example, in this I've heard, it sounds a bit like gossip. Yeah, I've heard you're in town. It makes me think, if I'm Mr. Jacobs, it makes me think several people in the office are talking about me being in town. For that reason, I think the past simple is much better to use there. Uh, Erika is asking, when can we use sir? So you could use, for example, dear sir or madam when you're writing someone whose name you do not know. For example, you're applying for a job. Uh, we would only say Sir Jacobs if he is royalty. Yeah, if he has a royal title. And honestly, I'm not British, so I don't know exactly how that works. For example, Elton John is Sir Elton John. I'm not a John, an Elton John fan, so don't tell me I'm a John, an Elton John fan. <laughs> but we use Sir Elton John because he has been knighted. He's a knight, but we wouldn't say dear Sir Jacobs. Dear Sir and Madam is also just for uh, very formal... Um, very formal situations. Okay, so we've greeted him. We've stated our purpose in our email. Now, let's move on. Okay, write a sentence now. How can we invite him to dinner? Yeah, invite him to dinner. I see some people, Beatriz is saying, do you have any plans for these days? Good. What other ideas do we have for inviting him to dinner? Here we're going to write a sentence that invites Mr. Jacobs to dinner. Um, maybe we want to ask about his free time, evening plans, and then we'll give a sentence that invites Mr. Jacobs to dinner. So uh, write uh, your sentences in the chat box now. Um, and while you're writing, I'll address some of the other questions. Paco's asking, sir or mad madam for letters, not for emails. Yeah, I think that's a good point uh, to make there. Uh, Gabriela is writing, I would like to invite you. Mm -hmm. That's something that we could use here for our second sentence. Why don't we see if we can create a table for some of these answers? Okay, so I like Gabriela's suggestion. I would like to invite you exactly. Um, uh, Irina, Irina, I like your first sentence, uh, how your first bit begins, but pl I think that please inform me what time is more proper for you. Sounds extremely formal. Remember, we want to have a personal but professional uh, tone, but not an extremely formal tone. Yeah, so try that one again. Nancy's writing, I would like to know if you have free time because I will appreciate to invite you to have a dinner. 
Okay. Um, guys, can you think of, for example, uh, a question that has, do you have, start your questions with that. Do you have, Lucia writes, I was wondering if you are going to have some free time. I would like to invite you to dinner. I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up. Lucia, I love what you've written. I'm going to write this here in our document so that we can share it. I was wondering, I was wondering, and I keep on, let's see one moment. I was wondering if you are going to have, let me just copy and paste this. Yeah, maybe this is the way to do it. I was wondering if you are going, I was wondering if you are going to have some free time and then I would like, I would like to invite you to dinner. I know, I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up. Good, good, okay. Um, some more people are saying, do you have free time? I was wondering if, so let's talk about what I really like about this structure, okay? This is an indirect question, right? And in an indirect question, we start with saying like, I was wondering, yeah, I would like to know, uh, just wanted to know, and we then connect with if, if, yeah? I was wondering if, I would like to know if, just wanted to know if, and I see Paco's asking about this, Kiki's writing some examples. Guys, go ahead and see if you can write a question with this indirect structure. One of these um, examples, and I'll see if I can make my screen a bit big. No, that's a little bit too big. Okay, so I was wondering if, I would just like to know if, everyone take a moment to practice writing a question uh, with this kind of structure. Let's see if we can write an indirect structure with uh, these questions. So of course the difficult part about using indirect structure, well, let's see some of your ideas and then I'll talk to you about some of my ideas. So write in the chat box now, an indirect question. While you're writing, I'll address some of your previous comments. I saw Carmen writes, I would like to invite you to dinner together one of these evenings. Are you free for it? Wonderful. Uh, are you free for dinner, for example? Yeah, good. I see Alessandra says, uh, I would like to invite you. Diana Carolina, I was uh, is, is it possible to use, I was wondering whether, or is it too formal? So Diana, really good question. Here on uh, indirect questions, we can use if or whether equally. It doesn't change the formality at all. It's also appropriate. Uh, so Martina says, uh, it would be a pleasure for me if you could join me at Tal restaurant uh, tomorrow evening. Yeah, that's also a great idea. It would be a pleasure uh, if you could join me for dinner at XYZ restaurant tomorrow evening. Wonderful idea. Okay, so let's see. Gabriela writes, I would like to know if you have some free time. Marianne writes, I was wondering if you, so here let's change your answer, your, your suggestion a bit, Marianne. I was wondering if you would be available mm -hmm, tomorrow uh, for dinner, for example. Good, good. Uh, Dean Ma says, just wanted to know if you are available at, good, just wanted to know if you're available at, Dean Ma, finish your sentence and write it to me in the chat so we can include it in our list. Kiki is writing, it would be a pleasure, it would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner at, yeah, at XYZ restaurant, restaurant, tomorrow evening. Let's include this here in this box because that will be our second sentence. Okay, so we have a couple of different options. Let's take a vote. What do you think is more appropriate? So uh, if you believe that I was wondering if you are going to have some free time is the most appropriate response, write uh, elephant 
in the chat box. Yeah. If you believe this is the most appropriate response, write elephant. If you believe that I would like to know if you have some free time is the most appropriate response, then write mouse in the chat. And if your option is, I was wondering if you would be available tomorrow for dinner, then write cat in the chat. So vote now on which you think is the sentence you would most likely include, and then we'll discuss why this is the most appropriate response. So vote now, uh, vote now by either typing elephant, mouse, or cat in the chat box. Uh, and I see uh, Alessio is asking, when the word join, when is the word join followed by with? So when we talk about join for plans, we should say just join, not join with. But when I say, for example, that two things are connected, for example, I have a pop socket on my phone, it's joined, I suppose I could say it's joined with the phone by an adhesive. But we're not talking about join with uh, for an invitation. We would say, could you join me for dinner, for example? So I see we have a lot of different votes, elephant, cat, and mouse. Um, Monica is writing that cat is a bit of a mix between formal and informal. Um, exactly. So let's see. I'm going to vote also. Let's read these three again before I vote. I was wondering if you are going to have some free time. I would like to know if you have some free time. And cat, I was wondering if you would be available tomorrow for dinner. So I am going to vote for mouse. That's my vote. Why? Uh, because when I was planning the email in my head, I was thinking that first I want to ask only about my uh, companion's availability. Well, not my companion, my uh, client's availability, right? So first I want to ask him about his free time. And I prefer the option mouse because it does that. Now I should pause and say elephant and cat are both really well written. They're both great examples. That's why they've been included here. So if you voted for cat or elephant, you're not wrong in doing so. Uh, but just in my mind, I'm thinking, I first want to ask about his schedule, and then I want to ask uh, what kind of, of free time he had, or excuse me, if he'd like to join me for dinner. So let's do this uh, now. Um, I would like to know if you have some free time um, one evening this week. Uh, now, how about sentence that invites Mr. Jacobs to dinner? Uh, so Ola is asking for a friend. It is much more formal. I would like to know if you have some dinner. Yeah, and for a friend, perhaps we could say, uh, you know, I'd like to know or just ask the direct question. The reason we like to use indirect questions in English communication is because it leaves a bit of distance uh, and respects the autonomy of the other person's decision making. So when we want to have some, um, you know, when we're speaking with a client, I think it's very important to use indirect questions, especially with native speakers. Yeah. Okay. So let's begin with our next sentence. Uh, we have a few different options. Let's take another vote. So our first option is I would like to invite you to dinner. I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up. It would, uh, the second option, it would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner uh, at XYZ restaurant tomorrow evening. Let's just change tomorrow for some evening uh, during your visit, for example. Yeah. Uh, and the third option, it, uh, it would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner at XYZ restaurant tomorrow evening. So very clear. Um, let's just, these, these two are very, very, very uh, similar. So let's just keep it to two options. So uh, if you are voting for option one, I would like to invite you to dinner. I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up, right? Barbershop in the chat now. And if you are voting for option two, right? Beauty salon. 
Yep. So option two, it would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner at XYZ restaurant some evening during your visit. If you prefer option number one, e, uh, I would like to invite you to dinner. I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up. Write barbershop in the chat now. So what's the difference between a barbershop and a beauty salon just while you're voting? A beauty salon is generally where women go and a barbershop is generally where men go. Uh, in the countries where I've lived, Spain, United States, and Colombia, uh, there's uh, always been a difference between where men and women go for their haircuts. How about in your countries? Do men and women go to the same place or do you have barber shops and beauty salons? So I see a lot of votes coming in. Uh, it looks like on uh, YouTube, we have some votes for beauty salon. Good. Uh, we also have lots of different examples uh, or excuse me, different votes, but a lot of beauty salon uh, and, and then some barber shop votes also. But I think I'm mainly seeing more votes for beauty salon. So we'll go with beauty salon because these are both great sentences. Yeah, these are both great sentences. I, I, if I'm voting, I would vote for barbershop um, because I just like how it sounds. I would like to invite you to dinner and this. I know an excellent restaurant where we could catch up. Uh, so it's almost like this does two objectives. It says the, 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 you know, let's, let's meet for dinner and let's catch up. But we can also do that in our next sentence. Remember, email and any writing is an art and this is a blank canvas. So we can do anything uh, at all. So since most of our, um, since most of our votes were for beauty salon, we're going to include that. It would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner at XYZ. What shall we name our restaurant, by the way? Tell me tell me the name of your favorite restaurant in the chat, please. Uh, and I see that, for example, in Italy, there are barber shops and, uh, uh, and beauty salons. Um, what shall we name our restaurant? So tell me the name of your favorite restaurant in the chat uh, now. Of course, restaurants, we're not having these kind of invitations right now, but let's imagine we can. So while you're writing the name of your restaurant, I'm going to tell you the name uh, or the objective for our next sentence. So I really like this word. I forget who wrote this, but, but, uh, but I think this is a great word to include. And whoever wrote McDonald's, you're making me laugh great sense of humor. I like it when my students have good senses of humor. So in our next sentence, I want you to use the word catch up. Yeah, use the word catch up in your next sentence. Uh, propose that the plan is catch up. Just write what you think should be the next sentence. We'll make a table with a couple of those different sentences and then we will vote again and finish up our email for today. So I see uh, someone wrote Ojo Rojo. That sounds like a nice restaurant, Ojo Rojo. But we're not going to take our candidate, or excuse me, our client to McDonald's. Certainly not. I suppose we would want to lose that, that client. So guys, take a moment to write a sentence using the word ketchup. Ah. Let's say a new Korean barbecue. So I have a student who has been a wonderful student from Korea who is a master at Korean barbecue. So we're going to say a new Korean barbecue restaurant because I love learning about the food in your cultures. It's very interesting. So I see we have some restaurant, uh, some, uh, some answers rolling in. Martina writes, what do you think about catching up at Meno Male Pizzeria near the train station? Wonderful, wonderful. Diana writes, it would be really nice for both of us to catch up since we last, since the last time we saw each other. Uh, so remember guys, generally we use meet for only um, formal meetings. 
Um, and Diana, in this situation that you're using meet, I'm going to give you a correction. Use saw instead. The last time we saw the past of C because uh, it's not clear. It, it seems that we have a friendly relationship and we've met each other some time ago. Uh, so uh, let's do that. If anyone else would like to contribute using the word ketchup in your invitation, go ahead and do that now. Carmen writes, uh, Alexander writes, please let me know when we can catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's okay for you, I could catch up you at 7 p.m. at the hotel. Evo, you're thinking of pickup. I could pick you up. So Evo, join me tomorrow in my phrasal verbs workshop. Guys, my phrasal verb workshop, you can come here, italki.com slash I stay at home. It's going to be at the same time. Uh, if you're early, you're going to learn with Yemi about social issues. Also, Ben Fang is giving some Chinese beginner lessons at 1245 Spanish time. So join any of those lessons. Finish up the day with me tomorrow, 3.15 to 4.15 Spanish time, phrasal verbs workshop. So Evo, I'd really recommend you be there because you've got a little error in your phrasal verb there. Not uh, pick up you, but pick you up. I'll explain more about that tomorrow in my workshop. Anyway, anyone else who's curious about phrasal verbs, we're going to be looking at phrasal verbs that end with the particle out, I believe is what we're going to be doing. So we have lots of different answers coming in here. Let's make a, few, a list of a few. Um, Carmen is writing. Let's see. Carmen is writing. We can catch up at one. Carmen, I'm going to change your answer a little bit. We're going to catch up. We can catch up at one of my favorite uh, bars, restaurant bars, uh, for example. Good. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Nancy, I see you have a question. I'm not completely understanding your, your question um, about reach it. Raphael says we can catch up with each other and have a meaningful time. Let's say to have have a uh, have a nice uh, a nice dinner uh, together. Good, good, good. Ah, good, Marianne. Yeah, we can also use catch up for like island tareas in Spanish or to do to the things that we haven't been able to do yet. Erika is writing, I hope I hope to catch up as soon as you are available. Erika, um, I'm going to change yours, but I really think it's great. Um, Erika, let's say, I hope we can catch up then. Yeah, good. Okay, let's take a vote. Uh, Martina is saying, is wanna correct or is it better to say want to? Don't ever write wanna. Don't write wanna, but you can, it's just a matter of connected speech. Want to connect in spoken English to say wanna, but don't write wanna, gonna, shoulda, coulda. Don't say that, uh, for example. Uh, so, um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, Raffaella is writing, there is a very good Italian, oops, not italki, restaurant in town, uh, in the town center near the train station. How about, uh -huh. aha, I see, Raffaella, so you're using here catch up in a different way. Um, catch up, of course, is to talk with a person about things you don't know that have happened in their life recently. I think here, instead of catch up, you should say, how about we meet there and then catch up over dinner? Yeah, that means catch up over dinner, of course, meaning uh, let's talk about new things in our lives and in business while we eat dinner. So, Let's take a vote now. Um, let's use colors, for example. So option one for our last sentence uh, is, we can catch up at one of my favorite restaurant bars. Option two, we can catch up with each other and have a nice dinner. Third option, 
we I hope we can catch up then. And the fourth option, there is a very good Italian restaurant in the town center near the train stations. How about we meet there and catch and then catch up over dinner? So we're going to use your names now as a vote. So let's see who has written the most recent uh, comments. So I see Kiki is going to be one of our uh, 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 votes. Kiki, I'll say Pilar. We have also a Rafaela writing recently. And then also uh, Erika who is contributing. So vote now using your classmates' names. If you think we should write, we can catch up at one of my favorite restaurant bars. Right, Erika, if you believe the best sentence is, we can catch up with each other and have a nice dinner together. Right, Rafaela, if you think that the next situation, I hope we can catch up then, is your favorite sentence to include. Right, Pilar. And then if you think that the last situation, Kiki, there is a very good Italian restaurant in the town center near the train station. How about we meet there and then catch up over dinner? If you believe that is your most uh, favorite, uh, if excuse me, if that is your favorite response, then write Kiki in the chat box now. So I see we have lots of different votes coming in. Um, lots for Erika. Let's for Pilar and Kiki. Keep on writing your votes, guys. Let's see what we can come up with. And then we'll finish our email and speak about that. So let's see what you guys think. So I see lots of Kiki, lots of Pilar. Wonderful. Let's use a Kiki response. There's a very good Italian restaurant. Let's use Kiki. It looks like this is the one with the most uh, response. Now, since we're naming the restaurant, let's delete here the name of the restaurant. It would be a pleasure if you could join me for dinner some evening during your visit. There is a very good Italian restaurant in... <laughs> Alessio, is that true? Kiki, did you do that? Did you vote and over and over and over? Is this a corrupt election? I sure hope not. <laughs> okay, so there is a very good Italian restaurant in the town center near the train station. How about we meet there and catch up over dinner? So, excellent. Now, we're going to finish our email. Uh, and how can we say, uh, well, for example, I'm just going to help you out with this one. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what you think. So, what do you think? How can we close our email? How do we say saludos? Saludos. How can we say saludos? What do you think we should say to close our email? How can we do that? Saludos. What can we do? Beatriz says regards. What are some other words we could write? Yeah? Diana is saying best regards. Irina says see you soon. Best regards. Mantanor says kind regards. Good. Dima says take it easy. I like that, but for friends, not for business relationships. Um, Martina says I hope to see you soon. Kiki says have a good night. I wouldn't write that here as as our as our sign off. Well, I would just say let me know what you think. Best regards, Warren. Excellent. Well, guys, excellent job writing our email today. Um, Rafael is also writing, as well as Diana Carolina. Looking forward to looking forward to hearing from you, Diana, or Rafaela. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Wonderful. Best regards. So, guys, let me just tell you: if you want a copy of this email as well as our notes, send me a message on italki. You can go to my profile, which is very easy. Um, my profile is just www.italki.com slash communicate. Yeah, uh, communicate with double M. If you would like a copy of our work today, 
go to my profile and send me a message through my contact form. Okay. You can just create a message there or message me directly and just tell me, Hey, I was in your workshop. I'd like a copy of the materials and I can send you access to this Google document folder. It's very easy for me to do. All you need to have is a Google account. So if you'd like to have a, um, uh, it, yeah, if you'd like to have a, um, a copy of these emails, either take a screenshot or feel free to just send me a message and I can send you, um, send you access. So it's been a wonderful, uh, experience. Thanks to everyone for being here. I hope that you feel more confident. Let's also give a big thanks to Jeffrey. Jeffrey has been running the technical components. Uh, behind the scene. We've got a team of people at italki running the show here. So big thanks to Jeffrey. Jeffrey's had a long day uh, in classes doing this all day, every day. So let's give him a round of applause and our uh, thanks. So guys, just to let you know, tomorrow we're going to be doing a similar workshop on phrasal verbs. Then on Thursday and Friday, we're going to be doing some emailing situations. So emailing a colleague, asking her to change the meeting time. We're also going to be emailing a service provider whose bill is incorrect, okay? As well as inviting everyone in the office to an office party. So if emailing is something that you'd like to improve, uh, then join us on Thursday and Friday. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we'll be doing a phrasal verbs workshop. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, hoping to see you soon. And remember, if you'd like a copy of these materials, just send me a message when I talk here and we can get in touch that way. Bye for now. See you in tomorrow's lesson.